Hello, I'm Philip Hooker, Vice President of Strategic Programs at Software AG, who are an initiator of the open source Thinedge.io project. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the first Thinedge.io community meetup. We've got a range of presentations from practical demonstrations of the Thinedge.io team and also um, incorporating our collaborators. These cover a range of topics, including what's new in the latest version of Thinedge.io, how it can be used and extended, and also real implementation examples. Before we begin, I'd like to cover a quick couple of uh, housekeeping points. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a number of application widgets which you can use. All the widgets are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around the screen to get the most out of your desktop space. You can expand your slide area or to maximize it to the full screen by clicking the arrows on the top right hand side. Sometimes your slides may be delayed, so pushing the F5 button on your keyboard will refresh the page. You can find additional answers to some common technical questions located in the help menu, also indicated. If you have any questions during the session, and we, we hope you do, please submit those through the questions widget. The presenters will answer the questions at the end of each session. But please feel free to ask questions at any point in time during the presentation. We also have two Q&A sessions for the presenters to directly respond to questions. Any unanswered questions will be follow up, followed up either offline, either through the, uh, uh, the Thinner.io community meetup group or directly via email address. In addition, we have prepared a short survey to crowdsource the topics meetup and also to help us steer the evolution of Thinner.io. To, to start the survey, click on the clipboard on the uh, bottom right-hand side of your widgets. In a second, I'll be introducing the agenda and also introducing our first speaker. But first, I'd like to say a few words about the Thinedge.io community. The Thinedge.io community is an online and in-person tech enthusiast group who are excited about the practical implementation of Thinedge.io the open source cloud agnostic IoT framework for resource constrained devices, which can be deployed onto edge gateways such as this, HMIs such as this, or even prototype boards such as the Raspberry Pi. We're an eclectic group of IoT, OT, and IT professionals from the core development team, from contributors, from the open source community, all experienced in the use of industry proven security, connectivity, and software management methods for lightweight deployments. During the sessions, we aim to replicate Thinedge.io's no-nonsense approach with interactive technology demonstrations so you can learn both from our successes and also our challenges that we faced in actually creating the demonstrations. So as you can see, we've got a packed agenda for our first meetup with presentations and demonstrations from the Thinedge.io team and our contributors. We'll kick off with an overview of Thinedge.io from Andre Schreiner from the Thinedge.io team shortly. Then we'll immediately move into technical deep dive sessions from the Thinedge.io team covering cloud connectivity, OTA software updates, monitoring, extending, and integrating with embedded C applications. This is then followed by our first Q&A. We'll then change gear with contributed demonstrations of live implementations covering uh, PKO security, brownfield evolution, industrial protocol conversion, and deployment into live production lines. This is then followed by a second Q&A. So with that, I would like to introduce our first presenter, Andre Schreiner, Edge Product Manager from the Finished IO team, who is going to outline the market challenges which led to the creation of the open source Finished IO project and the benefits of this approach. Andre, over to you. Thanks a lot, Phil. So let me share. OK, I hope you can see my screen. So hi, and welcome also from my side to our first community meetup. Um, thanks a lot, first of all, for joining. And um, first of all, let me introduce myself again. My name is André Schreiner, and I'm a product manager at Software AG and also one of the initiators of the ThinEdge.io open source project. As Phil already um, indicated i will give you a very short overview in case you are new to the project and then quickly hand over to the technical sessions and demos 
Right. Um, so before I start to deep dive on the framework itself and what we want to do with NHIO, let me explain which challenges we wanted to address with this project. So when working on IoT projects um, in the past, uh, we and also our collaborator, collaborators in the project uh, observed a lot of issues in the area of device enablement, especially when it comes to connected devices, primarily the ones used in uh, operational technology and industry 4.0 use cases and environments. Um, there are always the same questions again and again. Um, for example, how to connect edge devices to the cloud without spending too much time and effort in it, on it, or more concrete, how to connect existing devices, so not new devices that you, you might buy, but existing devices uh, or assets, sometimes hundreds of different types of devices, such as uh, PLC gateways, protocol gateways, or various um, uh, type of uh, industrial gateways in general uh, to um, different IoT or cloud platforms. So now let's take a more detailed look on those challenges that, that I mentioned. So first of all, um, what happens is that cloud connections become more complex than initially um, um, yeah, a thought. So uh, cloud connections for uh, such type of devices that I mentioned uh, can become very complex developments, especially in the embedded or uh, resource constrained uh, devices. So when development teams work on this topic, it usually requires them to overcome challenges such as making sure that the connectivity is reliable and secure. Um, while for few teams, this might seem to be a simple task, for most cases, uh, we learned that this is a, a complex because there are um, security reliability challenges, uh, there are hard dependencies on certain frameworks and, and coding languages, and in general, um, there is often a lack of software uh, portability in the embedded space. That means that um, uh, you're developing a specific code for a specific device. Uh, additionally, when we say connecting devices to an IoT or cloud platform, we usually mean much more uh, because there are key questions like uh, how to perform over the air uh, software or firmware up updates. Uh, just to give you an example, we have uh, customers, we have seen customers and use cases with uh, where customers try to connect more than 100,000 uh, devices uh, to IoT platforms uh, coming from different regions uh, uh, and uh, uh, different hardware um, and um, also the operating systems were, were different and uh, the software packaging approaches as well and uh, managing all those devices, making sure that the connection works and also the device management uh, um, aspects is, is difficult. And what it usually leads to is a high degree of customization. Uh, on the device, sometimes uh, teams are reinventing the wheel to establish secure and reliable uh, cloud connections. And finally, if existing frameworks are used, there is an ecosystem or vendor lock-in in a lot of cases. Um, so, And this is extremely problematic, especially in the embedded space, because those devices might stay in the factory or in the environment for several years and will always rely on some specific vendor or uh, IoT platform uh, for the connectivity and device management aspects. Um, and um, yeah, uh, there are also customers who say, OK, we need to connect our devices to multiple uh, um, uh, platforms, maybe even in parallel to do different things in, in different platforms. So um, just to continue, um, this brings us to the ThinHIO open source project. And these are the challenges that we wanted uh, uh, to address uh, with ThinHIO. So the main objective of ThinHIO is to make devices cloud ready without any ecosystem or platform lock-in. So therefore we are creating a modular and lightweight IoT device framework. That's why we call it Thin, Thin Edge, uh, which can be deployed on resource constrained devices such as PLCs or protocol gateways. It allows, um, allows out of the box um, connectivity and device management features for the specific device without relying on a specific IoT or cloud platform. So the use cases for Thin Edge are, for example, situations where a customer has already an Edge device or um, a different um, 
uh, software components for it, or the customer uh, had already a local machine with a PLC and now wants to connect this machine to the cloud to do, for example, device management. Or uh, customers that have various protocol uh, gateways for different industry protocols, which need to be connected uh, not only to the local SCADA system, but also an IoT uh, platform uh, to do, for example, uh, device management. So now let's uh, have a deep dive and let's have a look uh, about what Synedge is and which components um, are developed. Um, now, what I will show you is an, basically an overview of the different components. I will not go through all the details um, uh, as I leave that to the next technical sessions. But um, first, a general uh, point, the project is designed as an open source framework without any dependency on a specific cloud or IoT pl uh, platform. And we encourage contributions in all areas. So first of all, uh, to address the um, connectivity challenge uh, outlined previously, we created an open cloud connectivity and MQTT interface. And what this means, that, uh, th th what this uh, enables is out of the box connectivity to various IoT or, and cloud platforms. You see some examples on the right side. Uh, so we are using MQT an MQTT broker for the, uh, not only the cloud connectivity, but also for the internal um, uh, communication with a simplified MQTT payload format. Um, plus, um, um, we also um, have developed uh, mapping components or mappers uh, to overcome the issue of different payload format standards for different cloud platforms, but also for different services that might run on the uh, device. We support X549 um, certificate based authentication. Um, sorry, just. Um, skipping a little bit, um, um, to ensure that devices that register with those platforms um, can be trusted. And to ensure ease of use, and this is what you see uh, at the top, uh, we, instead of writing uh, code and configurations, ThinEdge contains a easy to use command line interface. So with few commands, uh, you can connect your device and do other types of operations. You will see that later in the demos. And the second and um, one of the most important components is the uh, area of device management. So we uh, uh, introduced a device management and monitoring agent. And this uh, device management agent can support uh, software management of different types of software artifacts. So at the moment, we support Debian package management. And we started with Docker management uh, um, and with a plugin mechanism that we developed on top of this, we allow anyone to extend the device management and software management functionalities without um, writing complete new agents. So you can just create a plugin and manage uh, the type of software uh, that um, are, you are using on the device. Also, we have a monitoring capability, which allows you to monitor the health of uh, your devices and proactively initiate actions in case uh, the device seems to malfunction. Now, coming more to the, to the left side of the diagram, the Synage components that I described can coexist and run next to other applications and components running on the device, which is usually the case. So uh, what you see on the left side are some examples for software that might run on, on those devices, PLC runtimes, protocol drivers, or existing applications that uh, are already deployed and running um, on the device itself. And um, we also, um, with using MQTT as an inter-process communication, open up the uh, capability to deploy additional um, services or modules or components on the device. So things like um, streaming analytics engines or uh, machine learning um, components that can interact over MQTT with other services and also the uh, cloud or IoT platforms. Now. Um, summarizing the advantages, um, so we want to give you a complete freedom of choice. Um, so um, using uh, the platform, um, you can, or using Synedge IO, you can decide for yourself which IoT platform you want to connect to. Um, we also keep it completely open which uh, programming language you want, uh, you can use to extend the functionalities of ThinEdge.io. So we are not limited to a specific programming languages, uh, language components can be written in any language. And the same um, 
applies to the message payload with our mapping mechanisms or uh, by using the simplified Synage JSON uh, payload format, you can also um, yeah, overcome the payload problem um, and map to different payload standards. Um, we also want to make sure that Synage can be deployed on most platforms. Right now, the focus is on embedded Linux systems. And um, uh, with Synage IO, you also don't have to reinvent the wheel when it comes to device management. So we provide you, as mentioned, uh, out of the box uh, software management uh, capabilities with a plugin mechanism. So that can be easily extended. Uh, and the same applies to firmware management and configuration management uh, topics that we are planning to cover in the upcoming um, uh, releases. And we also bring in the generic monitoring capability. And one uh, last point, the, the key area for CNHIO is to be efficient. So we want to be as lightweight as, uh, and as efficient as possible when it comes to uh, resource consumption. So we are targeting embedded systems and we do not want to occupy too much resources that might be needed for other uh, processes. Um, and therefore, uh, being lightweight is a, is a key focus of the project. Now, taking a quick look on where we are today. So this is uh, a little bit of a timeline with uh, all the versions that uh, were published so far. So we started in the um, beginning of the year. Uh, with the first preview in March, where we uh, implemented the, uh, all the MQTT uh, interfaces and also introduced the thin edge JSON payload format uh, with the mapping components first for um, uh, Comlos DIT, but also uh, in 0, 0 0.2, we uh, directly added the support for Azure IoT Hub, and we're working on a new um, um, yeah, cloud mappers to support other cloud platforms. Um, uh, device authentication via X5 and device certificates uh, was there from the beginning. Right now, it, it can be used very easily to do prototyping work, and we are also planning to extend that, and you will see more uh, around that in, in the upcoming demos. Um, so in 0 0.3, we uh, introduced the software management agent that I mentioned with a plugin mechanism uh, for Debian package management, and in 0 0.4, um, we uh, uh, also created a reference software management plugin for Docker that we also are planning to extend, uh, and also generic ability to download any software artifact from any source on the Synage, um, so it can be used there for software management. And in the upcoming versions, um, we are planning support for things like child devices. Uh, we are planning also to extend the Synage JSON um, um, payload format with um, additional capabilities like handling events and alarms. And, and there are some minor things like log reporting or configuration management uh, that will come soon. So last slide, um, now coming to my last slide, I want to encourage all of you to join our mission and to support this initiative. We believe that with Synage IO, we are addressing a real industry problem by creating an open and cloud agnostic standard for edge devices to simplify the interoperability between OT and IT. Um, and um, ultimately, this should allow any product to be simply and securely connected and managed by any IoT platform in an open way. Um, thanks, and now handing over back to Phil. Excellent, Thank thanks Andre. So. Um... So, as Andre said, so let, let's uh, let's now start our our technical deep dive. So, uh, with that, um, I would like to uh, introduce Sebastian Budner, our R and D ThinEdge product owner uh, from the ThinEdge.io team, who's going to show how ThinEdge.io easily and securely connects any lightweight device to any IoT platform. So, Sebastian, over to you. Uh, thank you, Phil, for the introduction. Yeah, my name is Sebastian, and I'm acting as product owner in our team. Um, I want to talk with you about a topic that's probably one of the first topics also for um, a lot of IoT projects, and that's uh, how you can connect your device to the cloud. Screen share one second. There it is. Yeah, of course, uh, this is one of the first topics for the, the majority of IoT projects, because what you always want to have is that your device is uh, connected to the cloud 
and um, that you can also send data to the, the cloud of your choice. Um, but there are a, a lot of things that you have to care about in the beginning that you probably really don't want to care about. How do I register to a specific cloud? Uh, how do I do this connection? How do I secure the connection also? And uh, that's a topic uh, Finetch IO also wants to uh, pick up because uh, redeveloping always this connection uh, shouldn't be uh, shouldn't be a thing in the future because uh, there are so many implementations already about that that uh, uh, who needs another implementation for that. First, um, to show a little where we are in this architecture here. Uh, so the first part we are talking about now is um, here in the bottom, basically. So we're not talking about this left parts here. We are talking especially about the command line interface, which I'm going to show in a minute. And we are talking about the uh, cloud connectivity to the clouds here, which is done by uh, via Mosquito. And Finnage is using uh, Mosquito MQTT bridges to uh, make this connection. And of course, uh, for the authentication, we are also talking about certificate management. So we decided that Finnage uh, connections uh, should always be based on certificates. And Texas. yeah, that's just the state of the art um, for, for IoT devices currently. Sorry, could you please um, Yeah, and uh, certificate management is, is not easy for a lot of people. Uh, I have to say, uh, I wasn't aware of certificates um, a lot at the beginning too. So what type of certificate should I use? How it is about uh, root certificates and device certificates and so on. So Finnet can take that over. And I will also uh, show how the developer experience for that is um, in a second. As Andre already mentioned, so we are not targeting to only connect to one cloud or to two clouds, but we want to be uh, fully open to, to clouds. So here we have some examples that we already have on our list, but of course we are absolutely open as an open source project to, be, uh, to have a lot of more clouds here on this list in the future. For the demo, I already prepared uh, two tenants. Um, today, I'm going to show uh, at, at the first hand um, how to connect to Azure. I created a, a Azure IoT Hub tenant for that and to Cumulosity and also created a tenant here for that. So as we can see here, my Cumulosity tenant is completely empty here and also is the Azure tenant at the moment. We are going to start to connect um, to Azure first, and I'm going to show for that the command line tool of Finnage. So first of all, I want to show how the command line tool in general looks. So we designed the command line tool really to make it easy for developer personas uh, to use it. So that for we have a try to make it easily understandable. And the second target was that it was also scriptable, but of course, if you are in a development phase, you want to do that manually. But later on, if you want to connect your devices to the cloud, you don't want to do that connect, uh, connection to the cloud uh, manually, and therefore it's also scriptable. Um, the first part of connecting to the cloud is always um, creating the device certificate, because it's for all uh, clouds the common thing uh, to use a certificate for that. For this to do, I also have to give a device ID. So uh, with that, it's made sure that I only have one device ID and that this is directly connected to the certificate that is created. So with this command, my device certificate is created. And if I'm interested where the certificate is lying, I can directly look into the configuration and there I see. Uh, because I didn't give any specific path I want to have, uh, it used the default ones. So I have my certificates for the device authorization now here in ETC Tech and have the key there, the private key and the certificate, uh, the actual certificate. And I also have my device ID here. Um, these paths can be changed. Um, so it's just uh, easier to use the defaults, but if you have uh, spe specific needs, requirements, thoughts, uh, you can change this path. What I'm now doing 
is also looking at the certificate itself. So for connecting to Azure, I always need this thumbprint here. And that's I'm, what I'm going to need in a second. But first I want to go to yeah, my IoT hub here and look for the host name. So I need to set the host name uh, on the Finetch side. So uh, Finetch knows to which IoT hub it has to connect to. And I'm doing that with the config here. And that's AZ URL. AZ is the short form of uh, Azure. And basically just copying that host name that I see here. Mm -hmm. And I have that. So now I want to go um, to devices. And with copying that um, thumbprint here that I saw, I can now create a device here with my idea that I already gave before. It has to match for Azure. It's important here. And I can choose self-signed. So the device certificate I just created is a self-signed certificate. I said that's for development phase to make it really easy for developers to, to get their device online and get started, because you usually don't want to care about connectivity that much. But if you are in a production phase um, setup, we you really want to use a, a real PKI and not self-signed certificates. That's also possible, of course, uh, but we will hear more about that uh, later in the session with Nexus. And I copy the thumbprint here. Click on Save. See again here that uh, yeah, my Azure URL was saved here. And what I do next is connect to Azure. So in this step, it's easy command, but there is a lot happening in the background. Um, it's giving printouts what is actually happening. So Finage is now setting up uh, the Mosquito bridge to Azure. It's also restarting Mosquito, so the configuration is actually loaded. And it's also starting the mappers, so uh, about the data formats that are transcoded to the Azure format that is required. We will also hear more about that uh, later on. And yeah, it's also testing the connectivity. So it's sending a packet to Azure directly. And it says, yes, connection check is successful. So my device should be connected to Azure now. Um, now I want to go on uh, with Cumulosity directly, because uh, we also have the possibility to not only connect to one um, cloud at a time, we can connect to both uh, clouds um, at the same time. I want to show you again. So currently, we only have this yeah, one other device here in my tenant. And we have under certificates currently no certificate. Um, historically, using certificates is still a little bit new. So to all the use cases, uh, there are not that often based on certificates. And yeah, but this is really the way to go to. So what we want to do now is, uh, as we did for Azure, we want to use that URL that we have in Cumulosity case here in the top and configure that also in the Finage. And this is a C8Y URL, which is the short form for Cumulosity. Paste my URL here. Perfect. And I know I should also have that in the configuration. So now I have uh, the Azure URL here and uh, Cumulosity URL here. Um, some background. So for Cumulosity and for Azure, we are using uh, public valid uh, certificates. And this is um, here brought with the system, um, the Raspbian operating system. But if you have a specific cloud that uses um, not public known uh, certificates, you can also configure here. Um, the next step for Cumulosity in, in this part is a little different than to Azure. I have to upload my uh, device certificate to Cumulosity. That's a step uh, that is only required um, because I'm using a self-signed certificate. Uh, in a production use case, I wouldn't do that here from the command line. I would do it directly upload my root certificate here and use the root certificate for multiple devices, of course. OK, my certificate is uploaded. And if I refresh here, there it is. 
and it's uh, directly enabled for auto registration also so that my device can connect in a second and I can directly connect to Cumulosity too. So here's the same process that is happening again. The bridge is created, Mosquito is restarted, and afterwards um, the connection is checked. This is always taking some seconds, but you can directly see if your device is working or not. Okay, uh, this check was also successful. And I can see my device here. And I guess what we are all interested now, so that the connectivity is actually already there, so we don't see measurements at the moment. We don't see um, measurements in Azure at the moment too. But if I want to send a measurement now, I only have to do that easily be to the local mosquito. So I don't have to care about my um, the connection to the cloud if I want to send measurements now or data now. I only have to send data from my application or command line or cron job or anything that can send to a local MQTT broker. So I only have to give the topic here. I don't have to give any IP because it's just uh, localhost is the default for Mosquito Pub. And give my example data here, which is just a temperature and send that. And Finage is now caring about uh, the transfer to the both clouds. Yeah, so uh, it's transferring to both clouds because it's connected to both of them. And I, re I refresh here. Also see measurements in Cumulosity directly and see my data point here with 22 degrees. If I go to Azure now, I have to open the Azure command line online to see that. Maybe a short refresh. Okay, now we are a little larger than wanted, but okay. And I can listen to uh, messages coming in on my IT hub. Mm -hmm. And if I resend the message then, that it's also showing up on Azure and yeah that's it for my part of the presentation and with that I give back to Phil excellent thank you thank you Sebastian I think you, you went through a, a lot there in a very a uh, very short space of time. So um, thank you very much. So, um, and then <laughs> then kind of leading on from that. So um, one reason we actually connect these devices is to perform software updates. And this is now being needed in the, um, the industry more than ever with kind of a Etsy uh, security certification, et cetera. Um, I would like, I would now like to introduce uh, Lucas uh, from the Finish.io team. who's going to show how Finish.io simplifies over their software management. So uh, Lucas, uh, over to you. Thank you so much, Phil. Uh, just give me a second. I'll share my screen. Hey, everyone. I hope you all can see my screen. Um, I'm Lukas Wozniki, uh, and I'm a software engineer working uh, on Finish.io. Uh, I have uh, worked with embedded devices for over a decade now, and I'm sure many of you have faced uh, the same issues as I did. Uh, when managing software over the year uh, on an embedded device, we often see the cumbersome process of, of uh, developing extremely specific scripts, which will perform the upgrades uh, by creating a tunnel to the device or, or actioning very specific set of commands. Uh, even if I just simply want to uh, push a security update for, for one of the applications running on my device uh, or for the fact for a fleet of devices, uh, I just need to remove one of the applications, which, which I don't need to be running anymore uh, on my uh, device. It's something which, which always uh, gives us a lot of pain. Uh, in this presentation, I'll show you how Finish.io makes software management easy 
uh, and how this can be extended for diverse ecosystem of, of different software applications, like for example, Docker, as you already mentioned. Okay. So uh, I'll jump straight into my first demo. Uh, and now, hopefully, you can see my screen. Uh, I'm currently logged onto my device, uh, on the Finish IO device. On the left hand side, uh, I have got uh, a uh, listener on my mk2 bus so this will show what's going on uh, on uh, the device in, in, inside basically the finish what exchanges are, are going around and on the right hand side i'll execute a couple of commands so uh, the first thing uh, i would like to do is to basically connect and then start the, the finish so just to install the finish is a simple command from uh, the web already pre-installed on, on my machine so uh, what i'll do here i'll, ju I'll just start uh, that bridge, uh, similar to what uh, previously uh, some others may have done. So this now has has happened, and as you can see on the left hand side, uh, a lot of message exchanges has happened in the background. So um, there are uh, exchanges between uh, the cloud, which I'm connecting to, as well as uh, Finnish uh, components. Um, so. In uh, software management, uh, there's a list of software. So, uh, sorry, I'm using uh, Cumulus IoT uh, as, as the example cloud currently. So, uh, as you can see here, I have a list of software installed currently on my device. But how about if I, I, I just need one additional uh, application here? So, I know that for device monitoring, uh, I will need uh, an application called Collect the End. Uh, currently, it's unfortunately it's not installed on my device. Um, so yeah, unfortunately command not found. Oops, certainly not found as I can't spell. Uh, there it goes. It's it, it's not there. But uh, with Finish and as well as the Cumulosity, I can very easily install that on my device. So just through a few of clicks. I'll go over here and I select my colleague decor as, as this will be something which will be required there. And now apply changes. If we go back to my device. Uh, oh, that's already happened. That was actually much faster than I expected. So uh, here on the left hand side, you can see there are uh, some exchanges happening between uh, FinEdge as well as uh, the, the Cumulus ID. Uh, but later on, uh, you can see that Collect D uh, just just been installed, uh, and all of that has been uh, actually set up on the cloud. Uh, and just to prove that, now we have our Collect D installed. Okay. Uh, as well, now if I refresh my software list here, that's been updated. Oops. My apologies. And Collect D is now installed with this specific version, as I asked it to install the latest. Uh, okay, yeah, so with a few few clicks as you have you have seen uh, with, with, within the IoT, I was able to uh, install an application and this can be extended to pretty much uh, any software uh, you want you, you may want to do on your device. Okay. So um, with IoT device sophistication with, with analytics with, with new features added on the fly, uh, all with cyber threats, uh, which is ever increasing. The security and reliability of edge devices are among the most important aspects of software development process. We spend hours perfecting our code, uh, but we all know that sooner or later we have to update our devices uh, or add a new feature. Uh, as enterprises still demand their product to run at the same elevated level of uh, resilience and need even less uh, field service engineers visit, we all meet with, with some of the following challenges or even sometimes all of those challenges. So uh, maintenance of the set of scripts for updating your device. Do you have to open an SSH tunnel for every single device? Or do you have to have a specific version of the script for uh, your device type? I sometimes have to do. Also managing a fleet of devices, uh, which very often will run inconsistent software versions. That's also uh, can be uh, done much easier with Finish IO. Uh, you have various device types and making sure that all of them uh, run consistent backend. That's what Finish IO uh, provides you. Um, so 
one of the main pains of, of IoT is maintenance. So uh, we finish IO, all your devices around this consistent backend, which can be easily updated and you don't have to worry about it. Um, how about your device security? So as I just shown you, there is a fairly easy, if, if you're in your cloud UI, uh, way to see what current version of the software you uh, run. And then therefore, if there are some security patches, you can easily apply them uh, via Finish IO. Um, so let's briefly talk, talk about uh, how Finish IO works. Of course, already uh, being introduced to that, but particularly uh, Finish IO software management over the year uh, has uh, two very important components. Uh, so as I already shown you, there is the bus uh, where all the messages are exchanged between the components. Uh, and also we have the data mapper, uh, which helps to translate or agnostic messages uh, happening on the bus to your cloud specific uh, message tag. So in our case, it was Velocity IoT. Uh, the second very important co component is uh, device monitoring, uh, device management and monitoring agent, uh, which helps to execute all of that uh, command sent by the cloud environment. Uh, agents may role is to be an independent actor which can execute operations from any cloud uh, that a mapper supports. Therefore, it makes the whole Finish Cloud, uh, sorry, Finish IO uh, cloud agnostic. Um, there is another very notable feature uh, of Finish IO software management. Uh, it is actually extensible. Uh, you should ask who, how and why. Uh, so we have introduced uh, the plugin API. With the API, we made it easy to add support for whatever type of software packages you need. As I already mentioned, Currently, I'm running uh, uh, something with, with APT, but uh, it also allows you to, to manage uh, some Docker components or anything else which you could extend for. So even though uh, Finnish IO components are written in Rust programming language, where we all uh, know how sounds, how terrifying it may sound, don't, 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 you don't have to worry about that. We, we follow about all those folks who prefer other programming languages. Uh, therefore, the plugins for software management can be written uh, with uh, your preferred framework. Uh, just need to adhere to the plugin API there. That's why it's this, uh, the kind of a little bit like a additional components to uh, finish IO. Uh, yes, so I'll jump now to another demo. There, I'll show you here uh, how we can fairly easily add uh, new plugins and add support for new type of, of software. Uh, with a very simple reference plugin, uh, which we, we should prepare for, for Docker. Okay. Um, so my setup for that, as for the previous demo as well, uh, is, is rather simple. So already, as you have noticed, I'm using Cumulosity IoT. Uh, and my device uh, is connected to Cumulosity IoT. Uh, it's a Raspberry Pi. I, on that Raspberry Pi, I have Finish IO, on which I have the uh, officials officially supported touch up apt plugin and now i'll go over uh, a little bit of code how the touch docker plugin a reference plugin uh, which which may help you either write or extend uh, new plugins so okay go to the demo and let's now jump to the code um, so, as you can probably see straight away, uh, we have uh, introduced the reference plugin in a, a, as a shell script. Uh, so I'll skip over the first little bit boring part uh, that is pretty much just, just passing off some arguments plus a nice help message so, so you know what to uh, what and how to, to, to use the plugin. Uh, I'll jump to the more, more interesting bits. So, um, The plugin itself, uh, as I already mentioned, has, has to adhere to uh, the plugin API. Um, so the plugin API asks uh, the plugin implementer to, to provide a couple of, uh, a few of uh, specific functions or, or subcommands handled by that plugin. Either it's going to be a shell script or it's going to be a Python script or as similar to our attach APTI plugin written in Rust, 
so it always has to do to pass this this uh, sub command. So, so uh, just release them will be uh, plugin prepare, list install remove, as well as finalize. So uh, all of those sub commands have to be handled somehow, uh, but not all of them have to. Sorry. Uh, not all of them have to execute uh, very specific code. So, for example, in our uh, reference plugin, uh, the uh, prepare command does not nothing. Um, one mandatory command for the agent to detect it is the list command. So, this list command uh, should return a list of software. So, as you've seen before in the API, uh, sorry, in the UI, uh, the list of software uh, is always taken from. Uh, from, from, from the device, it's, it's whatever has been uh, there after installation of the plugin. Uh, and the two major features, which, you, which is obviously the install and remove, so they allow you to add or remove software from your uh, from your device. Okay, so I'll just now quickly go over how to add the new plugin, and hopefully we'll have enough time so I can uh, install some something with via our newly added Docker plugin. Um, OK, so uh, theoretically, Docker plugin, as it's a, a shell script, uh, it already uh, has a shell line. It should be executed uh, by uh, my environment fairly easy. So the only thing actually I have to do uh, is to copy uh, that plugin into the one specific directory. Uh, so in, in case of uh, Tetch, currently the etc Tetch SM plugins. Uh, and the name is, is actually quite important because uh, it will show you uh, kind of like the plugin uh, name later in the cloud. So I'll just copy that file now. And uh, this plugin uh, has been now added to, to my device. And now we should see that all of those new, newly added Docker components. Let me just reload that. I'm not sure if it's going to be at the top or at the bottom. Okay, at the bottom in this case. But anyway, uh, so the plugin currently has been picked up by uh, the engine and should uh, update the list. Uh, okay, uh, hope that was very useful, guys, for you, and thank you for thank you so much for the attention. And Phil, back to you. Thank you. Excellent. Th thanks, Lucas. Um, so I think we we went through um, uh, quite a lot in a short space of time, and also realized that. Um, we're we're keen to get uh, as much interaction with ourselves as possible. So we, we have a lot of content to go through, uh, and then partly that's because this is the first the first meetup. So we, we're keen to make it as interactive as possible. So please please raise any questions, um, and we're kind of follow up either either online with the presenters um, or actually um, offline as need be. But we're trying to make it as interactive as possible. Um, so th then th so mo moving on a bit. So. Um, so we, we talked about software management. We talked about connecting. Uh, performance management is actually becoming increasingly important to assure the operation of connected products. So with that, I'd like to introduce um, Albin Suresh from the Finesh.io team, who's going to introduce um, you to how um, uh, Finesh.io and the capabilities of Finesh.io um, uh, uh, aid uh, connected devices to be uh, monitored and assured uh, in life. So uh, Albin. Uh, over to you. So if Alvin's having some technical issues, so um, it might be useful to move on to our uh, next speaker, unless you can solve it quickly, Alvin. Uh, so uh, Rena, would you be let me know if you're available to, to speak? Uh, yes, I'm ready. I can do it. Brilliant, brilliant. 
excellent. So, um, so quickly, quickly moving, quickly mo moving on. So, uh, we we'll come back. We we'll come back to Albing uh, a little bit later. So, um, with so we with uh, with Albing, we're talking about monitoring, um, but also uh, once you have that monitor connection, you've managed the 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 software. You actually manage the connection. Um, then the immediate thing is actually then to pivot towards solution and application building. Uh, for that, we have both Rina to take one perspective and Didier to talk an, take another one. Um, so how so how can a software developer use ThinEdge.io to quickly create an IoT solution? Now I'd like to introduce um, Rina Fugino from the ThinEdge.io team, who's going to show how ThinEdge.io can be extended with common rapid embedded software development tools. So Rina, uh, over to you, hopefully. OK, thanks, Phil. Uh, let me share my screen. OK. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Rina Fuzino. OK, sorry. Yeah, and I'm a software developer from CHIO team. Uh, today, I'd like to present how to extend CHIO to send telemetry data to cloud IoT platforms using CHIO. This presentation consists of two examples. The first one is a Python script to send the temperature and the humidity from a sensor. And the second one is a node red flow to send values from Modbus TCP client. So before dive into the two examples, I'd like to show you my Cumulosity tenant first. So I think you see my Cumulosity tenant. And now I have one device. It's connecting to Cumulosity IoT. And you can see um, the device is sending uh, temperature data periodically. I have one question to you. Um, have you ever faced a situation that you just want to send the device measurements to a cloud IoT platform? So like this uh, device. But then you will find that actually you need to write complicated code to manage the MQTT connection, security certificates, or if you decide to use device SDK provided from your desired cloud, uh, cloud IoT platform, then maybe you know that it's a little bit complex to run it. But CSIO provides cloud agnostic connections to many cloud IoT platforms out of the box. Using its MQTT bridges allows you to simplify your connection as it manages the authentication, registration, and data formatting for your IoT platform. That means CS.io leaves you to develop your Edge app in a rapid programming language like Python or, as an example, the Nodelet. Uh, it's a visual uh, flow-based development tool, or even other any kinds of tools, uh, unless uh, as long as it supports MQTT. So CHI removes the uh, cloud complexities and of connection and allows you to focus on the processing me measurements data. So let's briefly explain how we got here. So embedded software development is being hard. Rapid software development tools being increasingly used for solution development and increasingly multiple languages and tools are used in a single IoT device. That means you need a specific adapters, uh, which must be developed for each IoT platform. And the communication between heterogeneous apps is very complicated. And the developer needs considerable efforts to develop connectors for each cloud IoT platform. And the robust inter-process communication is typically tried to the specific hardware and software implementation. But don't worry, now we have CHIO. So CHIO allows software developers to rapidly develop secure connection between cloud IoT platforms and coexistent apps developed in any programming language or development tool. This allows software developers to focus their efforts on the processing and interpretation of the measurements data rather than 
the complexities of transferring the data from edge to cloud. So let me illustrate how measurements can be simply sent to the cloud using Python script and a Node-RED flow. This is my first uh, demo. Um, here, as you can see, so I have one sensor, which is a temperature and humidity sensor. And this sensor is connected to Raspberry Pi 4 uh, via GPIO pin. And what I want to achieve here is to monitor the temperature and the humidity coming from the sensor on IoT uh, cloud platform, uh, namely Cumulosity IoT and other IoT hub. So in the normal case, uh, without CH.io, I think developers usually go to the uh, cloud provider's official website how to write the code to send telemetry data to IoT platform. And here's a Kubernetes example. There's a Python example, but I'm a bit overwhelmed because I just want to send the telemetry data to Kubernetes. But then I realized that um, I have to configure server URL, client ID, also I have to give username, password. That means also your code has to take care of the connectivity and secure authentication between cloud and your device. That's a little bit too much. And as a case for Azure IoT Hub, uh, they have SDK for Python. But in general, using SDK is a good idea, but it's a bit complicated because you always have to learn how to use them before you start writing a code. But now my Raspberry Pi 4 uh, has CHIO already installed and connecting to the both clouds, Kubernetes and Azure IoT Hub. So what I wrote here, the Python code, it's actually only this. Um, the sensor uh, has a native uh, Python library. And that library provides also an example how to read the data. This is an example. So you see the difference is actually only those lines. What I did here is a change uh, the data format uh, to CHJSON model. It's actually JSON. And then add one line to publish MQTT message onto the topic touch measurements. And the server is localhost. That's it what I did. I didn't write any calls to configure the cloud connectivities or authentication method. Then let's go to, let's go back to my uh, community tenant here. So here's a temperature, uh, last minute. Yes, I'm receiving 24 and humidity, again, change to last minute. Yes, 64. And also, as well, IoT have side, you see, um, now I am receiving temperature and the humidity with the current timestamp, just five o'clock. Yeah. So I didn't do any complicated stuff because CHIO takes care of all connectivity things out of the box. So uh, let's move on to the next example. Uh, using Node-RED. I'd like to note that I'm going to use Node-RED just as an example. So actually, any tools that talks MQTT protocol is fine. So it doesn't need to be always Node-RED or Python. So about Node-RED, uh, Node-RED is a probably the most commonly used visual flow-based development tool for writing together hardware device. And the good thing of Node-RED is it supports uh, MQTT natively. So what I want to achieve with Node-RED, I'm going to explain. So again, I'm going to use the same Raspberry Pi 4 and Node-RED is running there. Also, I have installed CHIO on the Raspberry Pi 4. And on the same local network, I have another device there, uh, Motovas TCP client simulator is running. So, not yet, uh, 
is going to pull Motobus TCP client. Then the client returns a holding register value. Then not red uh, converts that raw data to the CHJSON measurement format, then publishes to the CHS uh, local MQTT broker. Then CHIO uh, will send uh, that measurements to Cloud IoT platform, Kubelosity, IoT, and other IoT hub. And so that simulator, so here, uh, address one, and it's generating a uh, random value from zero to 10 integer. Then how I did it with Node-RED? Actually, I made only three nodes. I'm, uh, the first node, uh, I have installed um, Motobus libraries for Node-RED. The first one is Motobus read. Um, this configuration is, yes, uh, unit ID one and reading holding register and location of the device. It's local host, uh, not, sorry, not local host and another device than uh, Raspberry Pi. And then that raw data goes to the function. Function, I wrote actually only two lines. It changes the format to CHJSON. And this CHJSON message goes to MQTT out. So going to publish onto the local host and the topic name is stitch measurement. This is a predefined uh, topic name by CH. Only that's this one. If you don't use CHIO, what you will need is you have to get uh, each cloud uh, node library. For example, as a IoT hub, there's this library. And for Cumulosity, there's another library. So if you don't use CH, you have to give the also configuration uh, to establish the connectivity, the cloud on the node But uh, this is exactly what CH does out of the box. That's why I don't have any more nodes. Then, so let's change a bit configuration to pull every five seconds and, and deploy. Yes, and let's check this Cumulosity again. Yes, now you can see that I start receiving the value four, nine, seven. Let's go to the Azure oh, simulator. Yes, seven, one. Yes, so only with these three nodes, I could publish my measurement to both clouds. So not that it's a very powerful tool uh, to save uh, developers' effort to uh, make uh, any configurations. But I would like to say the combination of Node-RED and the CHIO makes development efforts much lower. So, yes, this is a second demo. Then let me summarize uh, about my presentation. So through the Python and Node-RED examples, I hope you had an impression that CHIO simplify to write code or configure tool. And with CHIO, you don't need to worry about writing cloud connectivity, SDKs, complexities, or programming languages. The Python and the Node-RED are just examples that support MQTT. So you can use any programming language or tools that which supports MQTT. Then approximately after five minutes, your device will start sending measurements to your desired IoT platform. And a similar process can be followed when using CHIO to connect C or C++ apps. And if you visit our website and the GitHub repository, there are more instructions how to send telemetry data to your desired cloud plat platforms. So visit our website and uh, try it out. So thanks for listening. Uh, excellent, thanks. Uh, thanks, Rina. Um, so hopefully now, if we might better go back to uh, to Alban to, to go through um, how we can actually monitor devices using Synedge.io. Alban, are you there? Phil, can you hear me this time? Yes, perfectly. Cool, yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Alban Suresh. I'm a lead engineer here at Software AG. Uh, 
currently working on this Thinage uh, project. Uh, this presentation, I'll be showing you how you can monitor your IoT Edge devices uh, from any connected cloud platform. Okay, so why would you want to monitor your IoT Edge devices? Right? So these Edge devices gives connectivity, like enables connectivity for your field devices and sensors to the cloud. Okay. So there are several services and everything running on it to enable this connectivity. And then typically you will have more applications or services running on the same device, uh, which will be some analytical applications or machine learning applications, which is processing all the data uh, that's collected by these devices okay, and locally processing them to take some corrective actions and so on. Okay, so there is a lot of compute demand on these devices. So even though these devices are constrained, these applications add to some compute demand. And uh, to have an optimal performance, the, the compute requirements, the resource requirements of this application should never exceed the capacity of the device itself. Okay, now if any ROG process starts pushing the device beyond its uh, limits, say uh, overusing the CPU or uh, like filling up the disk, uh, which might cause, cause a uh, failure later on if the disk fills up. So we would want to avoid all these kinds of things, right? So if so, how do you even know if something like this is going happening on a device that's deployed on the field? Right. So how do you know what the CPU usage on the system is or what the disk usage on the system is? Right. The solution is monitor it from the cloud. Right. So before we get into details of monitoring, let's uh, go back to the go back to my edge device here. Okay. I hope you can see my uh, device screen. OK, so here I've got a IoT edge device and when an IoT device applications are running on IoT Edge devices, if you want to monitor the resource usage of uh, the device itself, many tools are available. So you have fancy tools like Edge Top in this case, okay, which lets you monitor the CPU usage, the memory usage, and even process level uh, usage of uh, applications. So the resources you can visualize it from here. Would it would have been nice if a similar visualization was possible from the cloud, right? So that you don't have to log into the device, but you can have a summarized overview of uh, how your device is performing from the cloud itself, right? That's exactly what we have enabled with our monitoring solution, okay? So now if I head over to uh, my Cumulosity cloud platform to which my, this device that I showed you is connected, if you view the measurements, so the device is all, was actually collecting some temperature simulator temperature measurements already. Okay. But along with that, it's actually monitoring the CPU, the disk usage of the root partition, and the memory usage as well. Okay. So you can, you are actually getting a visual representation of your system's resource usages from the cloud. And this will be really critical uh, when you are managing when you are managing thousands and thousands of devices on the field, uh, and you can and you can do more with it. So uh, since these me uh, measurements, like uh, these metrics, are coming as measurements to this IoT cloud platform, you can probably even create alarms or uh, something like that when uh, one of these resources goes beyond a certain threshold. Say if the disk usage crosses ninety percent. And then you can define an alarm that will notify you when that happens so that you can do some periodic maintenance to avoid an imminent failure. Okay. Now, heading back to uh, the presentation. So what are the key challenges when you want to monitor your uh, edge devices? Okay. So the first thing is that there will be many, many metrics that you would want to collect. So we already showed you a few CPU, memory, disk, stats, and stuff like that. So uh, there will be many more based on your deployment. You'd want to monitor some of your applications, external devices, services, et cetera, et cetera. So for every resource that you want to monitor, you allow to write some code to collect the uh, metrics, the actual uh, metrics from that resource. Right? And then when your device is connected to a cloud platform, you would have to write some extra logic, some extra code to convert this uh, native measurement data or raw measurement data into its cloud native format so that those measurements can be sent as measurements to the cloud, to the connected cloud. And if you are working with multiple cloud vendors, then you allow to write the code for each and every, this, uh, replicate this code for each and every cloud platform. Okay. So this pain of having to uh, write 
uh, code to whenever you want to monitor an extra data point and having to write this for each and every uh, connected cloud platform. That's what we are trying to eliminate uh, with our uh, with our monitoring solution. Okay. So we'll show you how we have solved this problem with ThinHIO. Okay. So this is the same architectural slide that you have seen earlier, and uh, I've highlighted the components relevant for monitoring in red color here. So there is this collect D component. So collect D is a very popular open source monitoring tool that's uh, used by sysadmins for years. Okay, this tool supports monitoring of a lot of system resources, uh, external applications, external uh, services, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so we have used we have used collect D as the monitoring tool. So this tool is the one that collects metrics from uh, the system or external applications. Okay, and then collect D will actually collect the stats and publish it to the local MQTT broker in a collective native format. Okay, and then we have our thin edge on device monitoring agent, which will consume these measurements collected by Collecti, published by Collecti. Okay, and it will convert that, group those measurements together, and convert that into a thin edge JSON measurement format, which is uh, locally well understood by thin edge processes. Okay, so this device monitoring agent will convert these measurements into the thin edge JSON format publish it back to the MQTT broker so that the, those measurements, thin edge JSON measurements are picked up by the data mappers for each connected cloud platform. And then it will be forwarded to the connected cloud. And the same data which is available on the local broker can be consumed by any of your third party applications as well. So if you wanna do some analytics on the system health metrics itself, you can do that just like uh, you uh, have analytical applications on other measurements connected from other sensors connected to this edge device. Okay, so this is how we have enabled this monitoring solution. So as a customer, as a developer, all you have to do is using CollectD, you just configure what you would like to monitor. Okay, just simple configurations, no code to be written, just configure what you would like to collect, how often you would like to collect that metric, and then leave it at that. Then ThinEdge will do the rest of the heavy lifting for you. Okay. Now let's uh, head back to the device and see what's happening uh, under the hood, and uh, probably even try and see how you can extend the monitoring uh, on a ThinEdge device. Okay. Now going back to the device, So all the monitoring on Pinage device is actually defined uh, in a CollectD configuration file. So this is the central configuration file for CollectD. And uh, here, as you can see for the demo, I had already enabled a few data points. So here, this load plugin uh, directive tells you to enable monitoring of CPU. And this DF plugin enables monitoring of disk usage. And here I've defined the interval as well. So CPU measurements are collected at two seconds, at two second intervals, disk measurements are collected at four second intervals and so on, okay? Now, if you try to visualize it, uh, what CollectD is producing by listening to the local MQTT broker, you can see that you are getting individual measurement values for the metrics that you are asked to collect. So there is the CPU, memory, and uh, disk usage also. So everything is coming here. Now these are individual measurements for each metric that you collect, you will get individual measurement values, right? And now if you head back, if you try to listen to TEDGE measurements topic, this is the topic to which our ThinEdge monitoring agent publishes the group measurements to. So if you listen to it, you will see that the same metrics that was published that were published by CollectD are actually grouped together uh, by the monitoring agent. So here in this case, the disk usage and CPU are grouped together, and in this case, memory and disk usage and so on. So this process actually converts into the thinner JSON. This is the thinner JSON native form, thinner JSON format. And this is the data that the cloud mappers or any other third party tools uh, can use to do any additional processing uh, on. Okay, now let's go back to the thinner configuration and let's try to collect one more uh, metric, okay? So here I'm going to 
enable uh, monitoring of the battery stats, so the battery usage of this device. Okay, so it's as simple as this. I just enable that particular uh, battery plugin, which will start collecting the battery metrics. I save the configuration, and then I restart CollectD so that the uh, updated configuration takes effect. And now, if you head back to the cloud platform and refresh, you should see the battery statistics appearing in addition to the, yeah, as you can see here, the battery stats are also appearing. Okay, uh, actually, yeah, it's 100% charged, so yeah, it's basically showing that particular metric right now. But yeah, as you saw, with just a plain and simple configuration with one line of configuration and without having to write any single uh, line of code, you, are, you got to uh, enable one more metric that could be monitored from the cloud, okay? Now, one final question before we end this, uh, uh, end this uh, demo. Why we chose CollectD, okay? And the answer you probably would have noticed already in the CollectD configuration file, okay? So CollectD supports monitoring of many metrics out of the box, okay? So as you can see, there is battery, there is CPU, the things that we enabled already, but there is a long list of uh, other plugins or other data points that you can collect your metrics from. So starting from this AD line number 88, uh, AMQP, ACPFs, Crony, et cetera, et cetera. And if you keep scrolling down, you will see that it's a fairly long list. So swap memory. So there are many, many things that you can collect out of the box. So you just have to enable, so here to line number 220, nearly 140 plugins supported out of the, out of the box, which you can just enable just by a single line configuration change. And this was one of the, this extensibility was one of the primary reasons why we chose CollectD, okay? And if you don't find a plugin appropriate out of the box, there are tons of other plugins available uh, out there developed by the open source community because CollectD has been there since 2005. It's been widely used in the open source community. So many people have written their own plugins for anything that's not really supported out of the box. So 99% of the time you will find a plugin for what you want to monitor. And the other major reason why we chose CollectD was the low resource footprint that it has, okay? So here, if you see, uh, this is the resource usage by the CollectD process, uh, the runtime resource usage. As you can see, the resident memory usage is just, just close to five megs of data and shared, so nearly one to four megs of runtime, uh, runtime memory usage. That's the uh, memory footprint, and if you, try to see the disk usage, the how much amount of, uh, how much data is actually stored on the disk. So you can see that this package is actually only like 199 KB of size. Okay. So with such a very uh, minimal uh, resource footprint, you are actually getting so much monitoring power. So that was one of the key points. Your monitoring system should not overwhelm the resource itself that it's monitoring, right? So that's one of the other reasons why we chose collecting. Okay, so I hope this session was uh, useful to you, uh, and that's it from me. Over to you, Philip. Let's stop Excellent. Sharing. So, th brilliant. So, th thanks, Arvind, and thank thanks for kind of um, uh, correcting the gremlins there. So, um, so then, then kind of going back to our uh, going back to our original track. So, we've we've gone through we've gone through monitoring uh, with with Arvind. We've gone through. Had to extend it for solution development. Finished the way for solution development with with Rena. Uh, what I'd like to do now is actually um, think about how um, uh, it, the embedded software engineers who are already experienced in using um, uh, languages like C or C++ how how can they leverage Finish.io? Uh, so to answer this question, I would like to introduce um, Didier from the Finish.io team who's going to show how Finish.io can be easily embedded into legacy C apps. So Didier, uh, over to you. So good afternoon, I'm Didier Venzek, um, software engineer. Um, I'm leading the Synergy uh, IO team. Um, and today I will present you how to uh, integrate uh, C++ uh, and C applications into Synergy. I will start first by a short um, 
uh, demo just to give you a hint of what uh, we are doing. Uh, so right now I have a, a small uh, device, uh, so a small sensor uh, connected, to, connected to Raspberry Pi using uh, GPIO uh, through the C uh, square I, uh, ASCII square um, bus. And uh, this device is sending data uh, on, uh, on Synage and I can see all the data on the, on the, on the cloud. And so I will just show you how to do that uh, uh, right now. So, um, what, what are the challenge to, 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 to connect uh, such a uh, sensor to the a device and then to the cloud? If you focus on just one uh, sensor, one kind of device on one cloud, uh, one, we can say that it's not so complex. So you, after all, this is just uh, another protocol, just uh, another uh, level of complexity, yes, but something that is manageable. The issues come when you have to uh, deal with a, a secure connection to to to, uh, uh, to use a certificate, uh, to use uh, to have something that is um, reliable, uh, whatever the connection issues, and to to do that for different kind of uh, cloud, different kind of um, uh, southbound protocols, uh, to have an, a sensor that can provide the data uh, to a large um, uh, um, variety of uh, applications and components. You don't want just to have data. You just you want to process this data uh, using a large variety of components and to to be able to send them over different kind of cloud, uh, avoiding uh, some uh, render locking. And for that, you uh, you can use Synage. So the point of Synage is to, 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 to be able to, to develop independent components, uh, for instance, uh, components that will consume uh, uh, data coming from different kinds of sensors, and to push this data uh, to various kinds of cloud uh, using uh, two, uh, two components that will help you. First, the MQTT bridge will deal with all the um, uh, security issues, uh, certificates, uh, authentication, uh, be, um, bidirectional authentication. The cloud will be authenticated on the, on the device, and vice versa, the device is authenticated on the cloud. And uh, this MQTT bridge will also deal with uh, queue the messages in case of um, uh, uh, some uh, network outage. So a first level, we, uh, Managed as uh, by the MQTT bridge, a second level, the so data mapper that will help you to uh, simply translate uh, agnostic, message, agnostic messages sent on the bus to uh, to translate them to something specific uh, to uh, a cloud, a Cumulosity, Azure, whatever. This bus can also be used to uh, connect uh, third-party modules uh, to uh, consume your data, so for consume the different data. But it's also an opportunity for um, um, a provider for, of this um, uh, kind of um, en engine uh, to uh, yes to, to 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 process data coming from a large variety of sensors. But also to to be this kind of these engines can also um, benefits um, the various uh, features of Synage. For instance, a machine learning engine can um, have its um, models downloaded using device management. You will have to implement a specific plugin to store uh, and uh, your your own models on the correct place, and provided that your engine will be able to uh, uh, um, collect this model from the cloud. So just a thin layer, I will show you uh, this layer, MQTT uh, bus, uh, will help you uh, to implement uh, various um, uh, sources um, uh, data processors and to interact uh, uh, between uh, all these uh, components. So back to the... Um, uh, to the code, uh, just showing you what, what is, 
what I, I run is is, um, is a very um, small sensor, a BME uh, 280. And uh, I, I just want to look, uh, have a look to what I have to do uh, to implement uh, something to read the data locally. So this is uh, uh, a device that is using I2C. And um, to, to, to read the data, Firstly, it's not so complex uh, and the surface. I just have to uh, connect the, the ISCRAC bus uh, to know the correct uh, uh, address for the data, to configure the device here with different oversampling, uh, to tell what I want to measure. And uh, obviously, uh, the, the complexity is not here. The complexity is in some library. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, the complexity is uh, um, in the library. Here, I simply use a library uh, uh, available for that sensor. The true complexity is here. Here, I just want to be able to uh, uh, get this data. So I get uh, some sampling every two seconds, and I just uh, emit this data. So this is a local program, and I want to uh, have this uh, working to uh, connect it to the cloud. I will just start with um, a direct connection to the cloud. So uh, this is um, I, I simply using um, uh, an example co coming from uh, on a community website. You have an example to send data to community. So you will need to, uh, if you compare the program uh, uh, to the previous one, as they are very similar. You just need to have a new um, MQTT client uh, library. In that case, I'm using uh, MQTT uh, Ho or MQTT. You will need to be able to publish data on the on the, on some um, MQTT topic, uh, so some uh, message, and you and the next part is to be able to connect. Uh, to uh, to MQTT, so you 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 need to um, uh, endpoint. In that case, this is the endpoint. Since I want to connect directly to the cloud, I need to uh, specify the endpoint where I wish to connect. I need an account, and I will need to provide a password or better uh, a certificate. And then I simply connect to my cloud. And if you look at the code, the code is everything is similar. I just have to send data uh, to the cloud using publish instead of uh, putting everything on the console. Now we have some, I, mean, I was about to say tricky, it's not tricky, it's just you have to know that on community, uh, you have to send your data on this topic and that you have to, um, all kind of measurements as um, pre, uh, pre configured with some uh, number to say uh, this number, for instance, mean uh, that is a temperature. You can uh, obviously uh, uh, publish different kinds of measurements, but uh, since they are not uh, predefined, you will have to uh, um, send some messages to community to tell, oh, I wish to publish, uh, say, a pressure. And so uh, I decided to, to keep this number to. Uh, uh, to um, code the pressure. So not complex, but definitely uh, 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 cumulative specific. So uh, I can just uh, make sure that everything is working. Uh, so I can run it. Uh, I have to connect because uh, this time I'm connecting directly to the cloud. And I'm finding my data. I can just double check that everything is working. This time this is not on this device because I don't know if uh, you noticed, but uh, um, I was sending the data to a specific device, direct connection to the cloud. And here I measurements. I have my measurements. So, not so complex, but um, cloud specific. And with Synedge, I will be able to do uh, something that is later. 
I will just pick my, my program, so uh, same program. And now I want to do something with uh, a Synage. I'm, I'm still using MQTT. I will connect the local MQTT uh, bus. So this is the local MQTT bus. This time I don't need to have uh, an address specific to a cloud. I don't need any uh, uh, credentials to connect this uh, local bus. Um, but um, my device will be authenticated to the cloud. So it's, 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 it's something important. My code is simpler, but the, the, uh, the features are more um, involved. I don't need to uh, create the device again. Uh, this is done by Cumulacity, uh, by Synage, sorry. For the message, the same thing. I will, I will, I will be able to um, uh, to send uh, different kinds of messages. Uh, this is a bit more involved, so I will copy part something for a different uh, piece of code. Uh, so here is my code. And so instead of sending data with a specific uh, uh, code, I would be able to send the JSON data. Uh, so uh, some clear tests that can be understood by uh, any application. So on that point, I see this is simpler. And instead of sending data to a specific uh, uh, cloud-specific uh, topic, I will send to uh, some local topic that is uh, sure uh, touch uh, synage dependent. Uh, I will have a word about that uh, later. So just I changed my my code. So just to have something working locally. So now I can uh, run this. I'm sending the data on the local bus. You can see what is going on behind the scene. I will just uh, send again this with. Um, all the messages uh, are sending to. Hello, hello, hello. Yes. Uh, hello, sorry. And um, And now I can see what all the messages uh, sent on the local bus. So I have the measurements sent by my program to uh, the TED measurements uh, system uh, topic. And I have other uh, measurements signed by a program, the mapper, that translate everything to something that can be understood by uh, cumulosity. And this is sent to a very sp a specific topic, uh, cumulosity uh, topic. And this topic is uh, uh, handled by the bridge. So, sorry. And the bridge is a process uh, run, uh, that's run uh, in the background. And that is configured to uh, send everything to the. I will just show you the configuration of these topics, uh, this bridge. So, Synage. And all the, uh, so there is a mapping different different kind of topics locally on my bus. Uh, something starting with a, a prefix stating for community and some uh, uh, remote uh, topic. And the key points are that my device is authenticated. I will, uh, I'm using a certificate and a private key, and I'm authenticating the, cl uh, the cloud part and so on. So there is a, a secure connection on site point. Everything is on the, behind the scene by, uh, by Synage. On the cloud, I can see all my events at that time coming on the Synage device. So this one, yes. 
So my, my, everything is coming uh, on this uh, community, thanks to the bridge and the mapper. So um, the benefits of uh, Synage uh, is that uh, to, to integrate uh, an application to Synage is a very light effort. Uh, the integration layer is very thin, and you have quite a lot of benefits from the uh, connectivity and interoperability uh, side. Uh, your connections are secure. Uh, you can uh, connect to different kinds of clouds. You can uh, use other components uh, to uh, consume your data or to uh, have the different various uh, sources. And your component uh, will also be used by others. You are providing some uh, analytic engine. This engine will be uh, uh, can be uh, can use any uh, uh, sources and will send his data to various clouds. And doing so, we are not bound to Synage. Uh, we are not uh, using a specific tool chain. We are just using MQTT and JSON uh, that are uh, widely used for IoT. And we, we just have uh, some uh, edge measurement topic. Uh, you don't have to have this hard coded. You can send your data to any topic, and to choose, uh, even you, customer, we choose to send uh, your da uh, the data to the stage measurement topic to forward everything to the cloud. But you can uh, use another intermediate uh, topic uh, for pre-processing uh, to uh, dispatch data on your uh, MQTT local bus. So just to so as a summary. A very light uh, effort to integrate uh, a an, an component into Synage and uh, connectivity and interoperability uh, benefits. Thank you. And uh, I'm going to hand it back over to you, uh, Phil. Excellent. Thank, thanks, Didier. So, um, so we've gone we've gone through a lot in the first in the, in the first part of this session, and I'm aware that the um, the amount of content and the, um, uh, the the energy from the speakers has meant we're kind of slightly over. So we, so we still have time, about six minutes, I think, about six minutes for a Q&A. Um, and there's been a number of questions that have been raised already. Um, uh, and we, we have we have so it's still got some of the speakers speakers online to um, to provide answers. Uh, and like, like I said earlier on, we're, we're trying to keep this as interactive as possible. Um, uh, we, we may look at how we well, I think we will look at how we actually uh, run these kind of meetups before, so they're kind of um, super collaborative and involving. Um, but with the questions we have, we've got so far. So um, maybe maybe Sebastian, if if there's a if you can answer a couple here. So there was one question regarding the um, uh, the data mapper. Um, so how how other what the uh, kind of, um, how other message structures can be can be added to that. So is that something you can answer uh, answer right now? Yes, of course, sure. Um, yeah, of course, uh, in one message, there cannot be only one um, one uh, measurement. We only had that as example now, but of course, we can also have uh, multiple measurements in one message. And uh, this uh, measurements can also be on different layers. So we can have uh, different measurements on one layer, saying pressure, temperature, whatever. But if I want to have, uh, for example, if I have energy and I uh, have uh, the current on phase A, phase uh, phase one, phase two, phase three, I can also represent that in the measurements. Uh, the number of measurements, I think, is only limited currently by the size of uh, the MQTT message. So you can send a lot of uh, measurements in one message. Excellent, excellent. Um, so uh, and there was a there was another question that. Um... Came up a little bit later regarding uh, the the structure of the message format. I think this is um, related to what Dinesh.io uh, needs on the um, uh, on the MQTT broker. So this may, this may be maybe harder to answer without, without a slide. But may, maybe there's some narrative you can provide straight away. Maybe some uh, kind of uh, links or, or, or guidance to where we have information online. Yeah, I think that's uh, closely related to the question before, and I think I already answered a little bit. But um, as you said, yeah, it's a little bit hard uh, to answer on just saying something. Uh, but I think the best go-to is here just the documentation in GitHub, uh, which lists pretty precise 
uh, what is possible and not possible regarding the data format. And uh, yeah, should be easy to find. Um, the link is also in uh, one of the answers to the questions already. Yep, brilliant. And um, so there's a, a great question that's just come in. So um, uh, asking um, what would be the, well, basically I'll read the question out. So how can I roll out and manage uh, ThinEdge.io for 100,000 devices in the field. So I guess this is more around the, 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 dis the distribution of the software asset into those devices. Yeah, of course. Uh, so the rollout of that would be especially then, uh, yeah, the hardest part of that is especially um, how you bring uh, the device certificates to the devices. And that needs to be done uh, on uh, the setup of the devices before they are delivered to the customer. So you bring their, uh, the Finage um, framework to the device and already a device certificate. And if the device certificate is already in the device and you upload the root certificate to Cumulosity or to Azure, the devices can be authorized that they are uh, okay to connect to the specific tenant. And then uh, you have the rollout with that. Great, but great. that's uh, um, also yeah. probably something where Nexus can, uh, where we have a little bit uh, more detail in the next session, maybe. Exactly, exactly. So, um, um, so, so I know that's now now only sort of two minutes away. So, um, that there was a, another question regarding um, uh, whether the MQTT broker works in kind of QoS, kind of zero, one, or two, or or some other level. Um, so currently we are working on QoS1, um, but the, the reliability of the message to, to further enhance that is definitely uh, a thing that we are really interested in. Um, yeah, but currently we are working on QoS1, so make, to make it short. Brilliant, brilliant. So so with, with that, I know we have um, uh, probably, probably more questions and ideas so it's coming through in people's minds. So. Um, uh, Let's um, let, let could effectively to run out of time for this first Q&A. So we have a second Q&A later, um, and we've got a lot of great uh, sort of content to go through from our collaborators. So, so let's actually now change gears and actually talk about some of our, or allow our uh, the contributors to show how they've been utilizing Finish.io. Um, with that, um, security is always a key topic of IoT. Uh, so let's actually tackle this, uh, tackle this head on. Um, so I would like to introduce uh, Thomas um, Horvath, a subject matter expert of IoT from Nexus Group, and reintroduce Didier, uh, who will show how finished IO can leverage proven PKI technologies to secure devices and data. So Thomas, uh, over to you. Yes, thank you, Philip. I'm trying to share my screen. So this presentation, uh, presentation is about, uh, has two parts, basically. I'm from Nexus Group, um, a PKI uh, and software and service provider. I'm going to do, uh, give you some introduction about PKI-based security for IoT. And the DL that you already uh, heard in this uh, in the session uh, will present a demonstration of what I'm only explaining. Uh, allow me a few words about Nexus a group very shortly we deal with digital ideas for persons computers and uh, newly uh, for smart things we are i can say one of the pki uh, pioneers on the market we do we create pki and uh, sell pki software for more than 30 years now we have also nice very interesting high scale iot applications for pki we provide services pki services for vehicles charge stations household appliances like uh, washing machines pumps and valves for industrial use uh, medical medical equipment our philosophy is to promote open standards and this is also why we uh, contribute to the teenage io project why do we need security in iot i think it's it's a common sense that uh, 
IoT devices are typically in the internet or close to the internet. They are typically managed by non-expert people, not by corporate IT who is already equipped with uh, protection tools. And uh, so it's internet connected exposed devices are a security risk and the natural target for cyber attacks uh, uh, that I think we, we think will increase in future uh, quickly. Why? Uh, a hacker can uh, turn a device to malfunction, which can cause physical damage, because IoT is of it, has a link to the physical world, can cause physical damage or even harm to humans. Uh, the IoT device, because it's, it's not so uh, very powerful and not very well uh, protected maybe can be used to host malware and attack other internet sources or also can be easily um, um, taken for ransomware attack you know where you have to pay so that your service and devices remain available it is it can come that uh, business relevant data is easily lost so that your competitors or uh, other uh, countries can make a picture of all of your customers all of your uh, products that you sold in the, in the market it can come to privacy breach so that your end users consumers can be tracked profiled and uh, all this data can be sold to organize crime uh, a very simple example to figure out when you are at home and when you are not, when you are on holiday. And cyber wall, I think uh, every, of us, uh, every of us heard about attacks on uh, critical infrastructure. So PKI can solve a lot of this, uh, many of these security problems. And let me just uh, list a number of them. It can provide for communication security and that contains uh, solving authentication which will give a proof of the identity of the device to a service the device connects to or vice versa the device can make sure that the service it connects is the right service and, and, and not a smooth service the data can be encrypted so that nobody in the internet can internet can interpret it but the uh, rightful uh, Recept, uh, uh, receiver of the data. Uh, it can, PKI can provide digital signatures, which again provide proof of origin and integrity on any type of data. It can even provide a so called non repudiation service. Uh, an example is a vehicle can sign um, a bill at the charge station, and, and the owner of the, of the vehicle cannot repudiate later on that he was charging his car at that station. Code security, uh, code signing, I think all of you know it is good that the device can make sure that the uh, the uh, fr firmware upgrade is has comes from the right origin, it was not manipulated, so it's in integer. There are also other applications you can put uh, into the certificates, in the PKI certificates, information about roles, permissions, affiliation, or the service tenant in the case of the uh, of an IoT platform. So a lot of information that gives um, the connected application gives connected application information about the permissions or roles uh, role of the connecting device. And I would like to mention that revocation is built in PKI, very nice feature. If a device gets lost, uh, broken, it's decommissioned, you can just revoke the, its certificate and it will stop being able to connect to any other devices or services. So how to secure communication with PKI? Uh, I will show this on this very uh, simple uh, example here. We have a, a device and a cloud service it would like to connect to. For secure communication, we need a certificate, a, um, actually a private key and a certificate in the device and also in the, in the cloud service. This certificate comes from a trusted certificate authority. <clears throat> the, the certificate authority digitally signs the certificates with, which basically links the public key of the device with the uh, with its identity, that means its name, its, its unique uh, identity, in in the IoT application, and the CA and the CA's own certificate has to be installed in own devices. And now the how to use this certificate um, say uh, that the device would like to uh, send some uh, information 
to the uh, to the cloud service then the receiver the cloud service will use the sender's certificate to verify its identity to, to make sure that it is indeed this the device X and not another device Y stating, claiming that he is device, it is device X or even a hacker software or something else in the internet. And now the sender can also use the other parties, the receiver's certificate to encrypt information for it so that only the cloud service will be able to interpret the data that it sends. The communication Security is provided also in the tin, uh, uh, tin edge.io. It, it uses actually MQTT over which uh, yeah, carries uh, yeah, the use to the payload data, but the transport protocol is TLS. TLS means transport layer security, and this is the most common means to secure internet communication. You use this every day when you are surfing in the internet, and uh, all the websites you are uh, connecting have a server certificate. They must have a cert server certificate because by default the browser will stop and not allow you to connect to the service, uh, that web service, uh, web server, if it has an invalid certificate or it has no certificate. Also, the communication is encrypted between your browser and then the service and in the same way between the device and the, uh, and the IoT platform or other type of service. The TLS is also very nice, cryptographically secure, it, and it uh, excludes the possibility for a so-called man-in-the-middle attack, which means that an, 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 an a third party can, you know, sit in the uh, in the middle of the communication between the sender and the receiver, and understand everything while the others, uh, the other parties, have no clue about that someone is listening to all the messaging. There is one key point. I mean, DLS is, is very common. It's, uh, you, you find a lot of literature, but the literature doesn't speak about how to get a certificate, how to enroll a certificate for a device, and how to provision it in, in a secure way. And, and this is this described in on this slide. On the same example, we have a device and a cloud service, and we, we would like to give the device <coughs> uh, a PKI certificate in a secure way. This is not a trivial problem because it can be, instead of a device, it can be a hacker software or uh, in, instead of the, in place of the intended device, it can be another device or it can be even a hacker software that tries to be onboarded to the IoT platform or to the application. So we have to prove that this device is the real, the one that we mean and that is authorized and, and this we call it the proof of ownership and the procedure goes uh, as follows um, the device owner creates first an account in the iot platform then he logs in to the device and starts the onboarding request now the the, the device will use the this user's credentials that means login name account name and password to start the process to start the onboarding process uh, based on this credentials because the device can present these credentials um, the iot platform can trust another device and assign it to the same account now as next so the device the service they can now trust the device this is very good we have proved uh, the the ownership of the device now what happens that is uh, that the uh, platform will create a password and register the device in the certificate authority it registers the device id the device unique name the password and also the tenant id of the user so with that, the CA, CA got to know about the device and knows, okay, I can trust this device if it comes to me and would like to have a certificate. And this is indeed what is as next. The password is returned also to the device. And in the same onboarding process and transparent to the uh, user, to the device owner, the device can now request a certificate. The, cert the C certificate authority can trust another device because it has the proof the request contains the unique ID and the password and the tenant ID and will issue a certificate exactly with the uh, uh, with these parameters with the user and the tenant ID 
uh, uh, for the device uh, with the device ID. So this is the theory, and now Didier can demonstrate this. Thank you, Thomas. <clears throat> So um, right now I, I'm a device that is uh, a, a new device. The device is not connected to the cloud. It has no uh, certificate. This is a new device. And I'm connected to that device. So this is the first link. I, I'm aware uh, this is my device. I, I can trust the, the relationship between me and my device. And I have to transfer this um, uh, trust to the cloud and then to Nexus. Uh, so the first step will be to uh, um, uh, to uh, yes to, uh, to to request a new certificate uh, to uh, to community. Uh, the, the key point to notice here is that this is to community. I will not request the, the certificate directly uh, to the to the cloud uh, to to Nexus at least from a user perspective. Uh, I have to provide the, uh, my um, uh, obviously an endpoint. I wish to, to connect to this cloud. I, I have uh, this tenant. I have an account to this cloud. Here is my username, my account on this cloud. So the cloud will trust me, uh, provided I uh, some password. And I wish to have a new device. So this one has already been created. I will just uh, create a new one. And I just, uh, uh, so I have to authenticate. So the cloud will trust me and trusting uh, my relationship to the, uh, uh, to, uh, the device uh, will uh, do everything to, for me. And now I have a certificate. So you can see that the uh, common name for the, uh, the subject of this certificate is my uh, new uh, device ID. And this certificate has been signed by SortYG. Again, uh, you see uh, no nexus here. Uh, I will explain you how everything is working behind the scene. First, I will just sh show you how uh, that now I can connect to the cloud using that new certificate. So again, some messages are sent to the cloud to create a certificate to show this a new certificate. And on the cloud side, you will have, uh, um, yes, just to double check. Okay, my uh, my device has been uh, created on the cloud. On the cloud side, I will have a new certificate. I can reload my list of certificates uh, of devices. And I have, yes, my new device ready to receive data and uh, to, to, to be used from Synage. So the user experience is, um, I think, quite simple. Just to be clear, this is a work in progress. Uh, we are still working on this, um, on this um, user experience and, um, and to, to have this uh, working on with Synage. Just to, now, next step to explain how this is working. First, things to no, to notice that on my Kubernetes uh, tenant, uh, I have a single and uh, unique certificate. This is a certificate, a certificate from uh, uh, to also to IG. This is all the devices that has uh, with uh, a certificate signed by to IG will be accepted trusted by uh, this tenant. You can notice that this certificate has been um, provided by Nexus. In fact, even my uh, device certificate has been uh, provided by Nexus and signed on behalf, in fact, on behalf of um, Software IG. This is done, uh, so the second important piece is, uh, of work is this uh, uh, microservice. Uh, community can be extended with microservice. In that case, we have a microservice uh, to register a device. My first connection, my first request of a certificate has been sent to that uh, microservice. Yes, so I have an application here. This is uh, 
my uh, microservice. This is a, a, a microservice that we establish the relationship between a new device and Nexus. So for instance, I can see uh, all the requests and uh, my uh, fresh request uh, to register a new device uh, number six. And now coming back to the certificate, I will just show you um, uh, some uh, low level commands uh, to to explain uh, what is going on behind the scene. The, the very first step is to create uh, uh, um, to, to create a signing request. C creating a signing request, in this is a two step operation. You have first to create a private key and to uh, uh, I can, it will be simple to show uh, the certificate. Uh, 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 so my, my, my uh, new, uh, sorry. So this is a, a CSR, a CSR is, is um, just uh, I pretend to be that certificate. I join my my public key and I sign everything with my private key, and this will be sent to the uh, to Nexus. And Nexus will be uh, able to to uh, trust me, uh, trust that I own the private key, and uh, he will uh, Nexus will need another mean to to be sure that uh, I am uh, who I pretend to be. And for that, I have to uh, send the first request uh, to uh, the microservice I just sent you, uh, show you. Uh, so, sorry, uh, sorry. Um, yes, so this is this request. This is a request, uh, uh, before I give my password, this is a request to, to my microservice, so to, to the cloud. Uh, to, uh, to my microservice and ask to register a device. And this is a new ID for my device. And I have uh, to provide some uh, uh, identity, so I have to sign in. And what, I, so the, uh, the service is, is called and um, uh, as shown by uh, Tamas, this um, service will check that I, I, I'm trusted. I'm trusted because I provided the correct password for uh, for this user. And so uh, this service creates uh, a one-shot uh, password and user uh, sent back to the uh, to the device, but also sent to Nexus. And now I just have to uh, connect this endpoint. This is. Uh, this, uh, the response, in, in fact, is simple. To, to, to get your certificate um, uh, sign, you just have to, to uh, reach this uh, service with this user and password to post your CSR, and uh, you will have um, the certificate back. Another, yes, this one. So I will, I will just uh, change the user password uh, with the appropriate uh, content. It just has been provided by the so the user here the password uh oh uh, that's very <laughs> uh pass is not always working. And so the password, but just the password. And the endpoint. And this, this request will just return me uh, the certificate. So this is the certificate, and now I can use this certificate uh, to connect uh, community. Thank you. So uh, I give you uh, 
hand over to you, uh, Philip. Excellent. Thanks, uh, thanks, Tamas and Didier. So, is um, uh, I, so we we know trying to squeeze PKI in, in, in the embedded space into kind of fifteen short minutes is, is is always really hard. And thank you for kind of going through that. That really helped. Um, so with the um, with the evolution of IoT over over the last couple of uh, couple of decades, um, what we're aware is there is very very few green fields left. So I would like to introduce Matthias Burtz, Senior Product Manager of Edge from the IFM Group, who is going to show how Finesh.io can be used to improve current IoT Edge implementations. So Matthias, uh, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Phil, for, for the short introduction. So um, uh, yeah, I'll try to, to catch up a bit uh, regarding the time. I hope you all can hear me well. So. Um, yeah, um, I'm Matthias Betz. I'm a senior product manager at uh, the IFM Solutions. Um, uh, yeah, um, and today I want to present uh, you a conceptual approach of uh, of how to yeah integrate an existing edge software product, uh, which is already under development for, I guess, two years now, uh, introduced to the market a couple of months ago. and um, um yeah we 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 discovered um how can hear myself so I make it a bit reduced and speak a bit on my side so um what um um yeah we we we, we discovered that Finish IO is uh, probably a, a good a foundation for an existing um edge software product um and what 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 that's what what it means um um, yeah, I try to 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 elaborate a bit uh, today. So, um, yeah, what what is uh, Moneo Edge Connect? Is the name of the um, uh, of the Edge software product? Uh, what what is it all about? So, um, yeah, it's um, for sure an, an, an Edge software that provides connectivity to several data sources in the field. So, IFM is. Uh, may be well known as a uh, provider and vendor of um, sensors and uh, components for industrial communication and also for PLCs for particular use cases and uh, contexts. And um, yeah, this, this is the, the, the main and the core feature um, of the, of the uh, product and That's it also awesome. has some edge computing capabilities like a no-code environment to create uh, user-defined data flow models to create new values based on the raw values coming from the data sources in the field for information process, uh, information generation and pre-processing. Uh, and we're also um, uh, currently developing um, with a new acquired um, data science company, which is uh, already part of the IFM group now. Um, uh, yeah, more sophisticated features like uh, predictions, pattern recognitions, and smart limits. Um, yeah, but it also um, provides for particular devices, like we have a um, uh, yeah, uh, um, yeah. really robust uh, industry-grade uh, display. Um, uh, it also provides information and uh, and, and, and interact possibilities for interaction in the field. Um, yeah, to to display events, alarms, warnings, and and also uh, enable the user to interact in the context where the data. Uh, is, is generated and, um, and, and acquired and, and to provide annotations, confirmations, to reset counters and so on. And so it does also have an interactive part. Um, and last but not least, the, the third aspect or the third core concept is um, to provide also a remote access possibility to use um, the Edge Gateway to not only provide access to the Edge instance itself, but also to provide access to connected subsystems for troubleshooting, parameterization, configuration, and um, maintenance in general. Um, so that's that's the core concept. Um, so um, the, the the software is uh, run um, currently um, on on a variety of, of uh, uh, devices on the left side, and here in the middle we we see um, a typical IFM edge devices. So this is the touch display IP65 field device. Um, it, it has a an, an, an computing module, um, which is roughly comparable with the Raspberry Pi 4, 
Um, and um, um, there's also an IP20 var variant of the same computing platform uh, for the Dean Rail in the cabin. And um, but we also um, uh, provide more scalable solutions uh, like this this little IPC here, which is also an image for exp uh, exemplary illustration. So uh, um, uh, there there are a couple of, of variants to 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 run the software also on on, on, on bigger platforms. Um, um, and, and of course, we also have uh, lots of uh, smart devices in the pipeline and already on the market that may also be a, a, a platform for the NHIO um, um, yeah, uh, in terms of much smaller devices and field devices. Uh, but uh, we decided to start with these uh, typical edge um, devices we, we have, uh, we provide uh, and have on the market currently. And then when we when, when we get familiar with the concepts and, and have the team up and running, um, uh, then go further with uh, smaller devices, which is usually a much bigger challenge. Um, so uh, yeah, what are the current features? I already said that we have uh, some inbound connectivity for uh, I/O link masters, in particular the IFM I/O link masters, but also smart devices for vibration analysis. Um, which is the VSE for particular use cases. Uh, for the VSE actually just consumes four, uh, four data from coming from four sensors, uh, 50 or 40,000 values per second each, and reduces it to, um, to uh, mechanical KPIs uh, to get an, um, an idea of, of, of what, what, what's going on with the, with, the, with the mechanical rotating equipment in general. And um, it also has a the remote access client. Uh, I already told that we have this data flow modeling thing. Uh, so, and um, maybe maybe more important here is the outbound connectivity. We already provide an MQTT client uh, that that enables uh, the user to pick and choose particular data sources um, and data streams and publish messages on a given broker. Uh, but we also have uh, already included um, uh, these four um, yeah cloud connectors. Um, to enable the user to to onboard the uh, edge device to those particular cloud platforms and, um, and do the connection there. So um, uh, here some screenshots how it, how it is designed. Um, so it's it's mainly focused on simplicity to to uh, yeah to, to 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 enable and empower the the OT workers to um, participate in IIoT projects. Um, uh, to make um, yeah the, the onboarding of data sources from the field uh, really simple, and then yeah we call it plug and work um, as as, as uh, with with reference to the plug and play um, we already had um, on, in the IT world, and um, yeah it, it's it's basically a couple of simple steps you have to provide you just configure some target systems as I already described these these cloud platforms or an existing MQTT broker. And you go to the data sources, um, scan the network um, for um, if, if the devices support a particular um, device discovery um, standard, and uh, or you just enter an IP address or something, and then um, yeah, we, we we use drivers. Uh, we have a couple of drivers to to connect to those devices, read out the metadata, and also subscribe to the um, to the provided data streams coming from the devices. Um, um, in in the next step, you just um, yeah, the, 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 the Moneo Edge Connect creates an, um, an topology of, of, of connected devices um, um, with, with, which represents the wiring and so on. And then you can just, as you see here um, in these different columns, um, uh, you can provide those data streams to cockpit, to an MQTT broker, or to uh, the Comelocity IoT platform here in this case. And, and just route the data from the source to the target. Um, on the way, um, here on the right side, you see um, the possibility to have an, kind of a really lightweight, no-code environment to do some pre-processing, logic, arithmetic, arithmetics, and, um, and, and, and conversations, uh, con yeah, con conversions um, here with the, with, the, with the provided data streams to create new information based on the input. And uh, last but not least, you can create some interactive elements to um, to uh, this 
to use the display, um, uh, uh, and it, it's, it's maybe not, not that relevant in, in, in case of headless devices. So, um, but uh, what I really want to talk about today is um, the question. So, so if, if we take this existing software and um, and we want to leverage from all the advantages that um, and all the obvious advantages that Lineage um, provides. Um, we, um, um, yeah, we, we have to think about how to, to use the existing, yeah, so to speak, architecture um, presented here in that, bill, uh, in, in that picture to, yeah, to, to use the existing software, place it in that architecture and use uh, as much of uh, the existing features to, um, yeah, to some extent, um, um, create a, a kind of an abstraction layer that is lightweight, uh, does not uh, um, consume too much uh, resources on the existing device, uh, but but provides some um, significant um, uh, advantages to to the um, uh, yeah to the existing solution. Um, um, uh, and and what what we have here in mind uh, especially is um, the question. Um, of how to leverage from the device management and monitoring agent, which is uh, still a gap in the existing product. Um, um, and um, yeah, so we started to to, to conceptualize um, how to uh, yeah how to bring these two um, um, approaches together. So um, as a first step, um, we just yeah, I just want to show you that that we consider our, ourselves the the, the Mono Edge Connect software as an other component <laughs> in that case that uh, provides some capabilities like connectivity to I/O link devices, these vibration diagnostic units, PLC sensors, and, and whatsoever um, in the OT level. Uh, it is a commercial software product. It has some benefits. It's really user friendly and has a simple UX design. Um, um, and um, and and we want and, and it actually has already the capability to connect to Comelocity, Azure, Google, and, and AWS. Um, but we want to transform that and use uh, the DNHIO platform to um, yeah to to, um, to to provide an abstraction um, uh, and, and, and an under, underlying layer uh, to um, yeah to to. To leverage from the advantages of, of the of the NHIO framework, so um, um, as a first step, we we are thinking about using the existing um, MQTT uh, client uh, to not publish uh, to some uh, uh, broker, but to the local broker provided by NHIO. Um, there we uh, then we just publish um, there the uh, acquired data that that comes from the drivers and from the field devices. And also provide a mapper to convert that IFM IoT core format. And that's how we call it internally, um, and convert it to uh, to the to the thin edge uh, IO format, and uh, then um, yeah send the process data to the uh, commercial IoT platform as a first step. Um, uh, but but we also want to um, yeah leverage from um, from the device management capabilities. Um, so it's it's for us, uh, um, uh, yeah. As as as, as we have already a, a strong relationship and a partnership with Software AG, um, uh, it's also for us a, a good uh, place to collaborate and to try out the um, uh, device management functionality and uh, and 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 implement that um, via this channel on. Um, uh, and, and using ThinHIO to to use the Comelocity IoT to manage and um, Moneo Edge Connect instance. And um, of course, uh, we are also um, already have an, an, an on-premise software and we want to um, uh, uh, transform this software to the cloud. This is uh, mainly planned for the next year. It's already uh, an ongoing process. Um, and um, yeah, we are currently con at least considering to use this, this mechanism also for the um, um, Moneo um, software as a service, um, um, uh, which we uh, currently call the Moneo Cloud. Um, and um, yeah, and, and as you may already see, there are some uh, double things um, already um, uh, existing here. And 
and, and, and also under development um, here in the ThinHIO world. So um, as, a, as, an, as a final step, we may um, contribute uh, or we may uh, switch from our uh, own implementations um, to, uh, to the uh, ThinHIO implementations and, and co contribute here as well, of course. And maybe someday in the future also, um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, at least support um, the, 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 the integration of Google Cloud uh, connectivity or AWS. So this is also um, something we, we are thinking of, but this is more a long-term uh, idea. Um, and yeah, um, to, um, these are our first conceptual steps. Um, uh, maybe to sum this, this all up, so we are currently um, uh, focusing on two main uh, aspects or areas of concern. So there are some organizational aspects. So the NHIO is for IFM and definitely a very promising approach, not only for small edge instances. Uh, so we start with the, with the uh, uh, yeah, bigger uh, uh, instances and use it as a foundation or framework. Um, we uh, already committed to contribute with at least uh, two um, FTEs. Um, um, we are still in a conceptual phase, um, and we, we, we really faced uh, uh, the challenge of hiring Rust developers um, in the last couple of months, but we, we were to some extent success, successful, and we will um, actively contribute from the beginning of 2020, uh, of 22. So this, um, this is good news. And, um, and um, yeah, the main aspects for IFM, as I already said, is um, yeah, the, the handling of the, of the huge variety of, of OT devices and data sources. So therefore the data mapping uh, to, yeah, to transfer this, this uh, heterogeneous world of the OT uh, in terms of semantics um, into, into a common uh, thin HIO model uh, is, a, is, a, is a central key aspect. Uh, we are also um, uh, looking, uh, uh, highlighting the security aspects of Rust um, and we see this also as a key success factor for ThinHIO. And last but not least, um, uh, but maybe um, for us, really from a strategic point of view for our products, and really important aspect is the device management agent, um, not only for the edge itself, but also for the underlying connected devices. But um, as I already said, step by step. Um, and um, so um, we're really, really looking forward to work closer, more closer together with with uh, our colleagues from Software AG and uh, hopefully um, many others that uh, uh, will join the, the community um, in, in the near future um, to create here and, and, and really promising um, yeah, uh, edge uh, uh, approach for um, yeah, not, not only for free, but maybe also as a good foundation for, um, of, for commercial products. Um, so this, this, uh, this is, uh, yeah, uh, the way we, we see uh, the FinHIO. Um, yeah, um, so uh, that's that's from my side, uh, some few comments on, on our conceptual considerations. And um, yeah, and, and, and um, I, I, I was really lucky to see also these, this, this kind of uh, spirit of prototyping that is currently in the community. Um, and uh, maybe we can also create, already create with the existing features of Edge Connect a kind of a prototype um, based on the approach that Rina uh, presented. So maybe Rina, I, I will uh, uh, probably connect you afterwards uh, to, to share the experience uh, with uh, Node Red you made, and, and maybe we can uh, already create uh, a an, an, an prototype um, pretty soon uh, to, to connect. Money Edge Connect with NHIO. So uh, thank you very much for your attention, and um, yeah, back to Phil. Excellent. Thank, thanks, Matthias. So um, uh, as, as you can see, there's a, a lot of kind of great insight and innovation sort of happening with the with, with the community. So um, uh, I'm aware that uh, our time's rumbling on, and we have uh, two two great people to um, uh, still to still to talk about their their particular implementations of Edge.io. So uh, I'm keen to kind of quickly go on to that. So we might have a slightly shorter space for Q&A uh, at the end. Uh, but so whereas the um, the early presenters have talked about uh, how 
finished IO can interwork with the current uh, edge applications. Uh, what if that application actually translate industry protocols uh, to control external assets? Uh, and for that, and to answer that question, I'd like to introduce uh, Edgar Razia uh, from uh, IPCOM, who's going to show how Finish.io can be used to connect industrial field devices to the cloud. So, Edgar, over to you. Um, hello, and welcome, everybody, to my presentation. Um, I, my name is Edgar Zeiser, and um, I will show you in my presentation how you can use our uh, solution called uh, IPCon uh, to connect a few bus devices, uh, a few few devices uh, to cloud services. <clears throat> uh, I'm working as a software developer for the last uh, seven years at ITCOM, and uh, I'm uh, mostly um, occupied in implementing uh, pro protocol um, uh, protocols like uh, OPC UA, MQTT, or S7. By the way, MQTT is the reason why, uh, why I'm also responsible for the, for the integration of our um, uh, gateway solution towards the cloud services. Um, so what is ITCOM all about? ITCOM is a middle-sized company which was founded uh, some 20 years ago and is located in uh, Nuremberg, in the middle of Bavaria, Germany. And from day one, uh, Bitcom has specialized and focused on machine-to-machine -machine communication, especially in, in the industrial domain, and provides um, software, a few software solution as well as um, uh, hardware with the software equipped. Um, mostly, you will find our uh, communication solution um, uh, in the electricity domain uh, for any kind of automation, automatization purposes. Um, exactly. Yes. Um, what is IPConf all about? IPConf, as I already told, is a pure software solution, and IPConf stands for Industrial Protocol Conversion. I think this um, this term um, describes at best what it what the major major task of this uh, software is. It is to um, extract the information from uh, from a certain protocol and to be able to map it to a completely different protocol. And these protocols might uh, have different uh, physical interfaces, different, different communication schemes, and so on. It doesn't matter. We are able, IPConf is able to uh, to map this information between um, uh, between different different protocols. Um, usually, we at the time when IBConf uh, was developed, uh, there was no such thing like IoT. It was the upcoming of the internet, to be honest, and um, that's why you find our gateway solution IBConf uh, as um, Usually in, in Scala-like applications, they have on the bottom level the field uh, field devices. It might be an IED, an R, I, IED, RTU, or PLC. And at the top level, you have like some control devices, whether it's a Scala, a TSO, or a control center. And um, the goal of IDConf is now to um, to be able to connect these field devices. Let's pick, for example, the IID on the left side, which talks 61850, a very popular popular uh, protocol within the um, ele electricity domain. The goal is to retrieve a measurement from this um, IID and to be able to dispatch it, for example, to all three participants at top. Okay. IPConf. Um, is not bound to a particular platform, so it can be run uh, under Linux, on Windows, or even um, or even as a virtual appliance. And um, obviously, it has support for multiple protocols, which can run on the on the gateway simultaneously. And its uh, its architectural design allows it um, to allows us to um, to use the same piece of 
software on different devices, which which um, it doesn't matter if it's a small device handling only 500 uh, data points or a high-end device which will uh, cope with up to 200,000 data points. It's the same software which running, and it's um, great ev evidence for the robustness of the software solution. On which products, which which are the products which you can which you can buy, providing uh, equipped with IDConf? Um, there's a bunch of it. The, um, the main criteria to decide which uh, solution fits best for your use case is uh, the question how many how many processing power you require and um, what kind of interfaces you want there to be. For example, if you want, need to connect communication equipment, communication partners which um, use Profi, not a Profi, but then the Mac 2 in the, uh, is the right choice for you. If you if you only have a small application, you will pick the ARM-based um, SEC3. And if you want to manage and control a complete wind park, then, then the IPC191 i7 is the best choice for you, which, as I already mentioned before, can handle up to 200,000 data points and uh, hundreds of uh, different communication partners. At this point, I would like also to show you um, to show you a website which we which we created uh, in order to support you for fi in finding the right um, solution for you for your use case. Uh, there are basically three steps involved. The first one, in the first step, you you select the protocol which is to be supported. I have made it a selection here. On three, uh, three of three protocols, it's OPC UA client, a seven protocol, and the 61850 client, and the system provides you all applicable solutions. In the second step, you determine <coughs> how much performance uh, is required and uh, which kind of platform should be used, whether it's device bound platform or just or a pure software solution. And so there are a couple other things like the interface, number of interface required, and the type of interfaces. Whether it's gonna should be a solar or a device with I, digital I/O. After you you've done your selection, you you just need to select the um, the desired uh, product, and in the third step, there will be a price presented to you. All right. Not with the commercials. <coughs> let's take a look. Um, let's take a look to the uh, to the setup which I've created to um, to demonstrate the ability of IPCon in connecting field devices uh, to a cloud service. In this case, the cloud service is um, is a Cumulosity IoT and. I think I will switch to another theme. Just give me a second. Uh, yes, this is what I'm looking for. No, now you should uh, now you should see um, to, on the left on the bottom left uh, in the bottom left corner you should see the physical uh, the physical uh, demonstration setup which I, which I have prepared. So basically, we have on the bottom line the field devices, uh, and on the top the cloud service. It, it, you can tell you can tell also that on the bottom level it's the OT environment, OT world, operation technology, and above you have the IT, the information technology, and IPConf is like the um, the thing that uh, glues both parts together. So IPConf, <coughs> IPConf. Um, task of IPConf is to collect the data from the field devices and um, to present and publish it uh, securely to the cloud. We will see which uh, we will see how, how this is done and which which kind of failures might uh, might appear in such a um, uh, setup. Let me 
let me explain explain a little bit the setup in more detail. So we we have um, in the field level we have uh, one field device. It's from Vago. It acts as an RTU and is connected by IAC 104 to the, to the gateway. Then we have an um, a very popular small Siemens PLC, which connects uh, by, S by, the, by the S7 protocol to the IPConf gateway. And uh, on the very left side, we have uh, an HMI panel, which uh, shows us the simulated uh, field data and gives us uh, the, the right now in the, at the field, there are two measure analog measurements which are simulated. These are uh, shown by the bars on the left side. You have a, a wireless bar for the, for the measurement which comes from the PLC, Siemens PLC, and you have a blue bar which for the measurement which comes from Vago PLC. Um, moreover, the HMI panel provide, uh, offers us a toggle switch which allows us to create an alarm on the field level which should also all of these process data should be tra uh, transported by the or um, retrieved by the uh, by the gateway and uh, sent to the cloud. The gateway itself has two network connections. The red red cable connects it to the Ethernet, and the green cable connects it to the field devices and to my local PC, uh, such such that I can uh, configure it and show you some demonstrations. Um, now that we have we have seen the demonstrational setup, let's take a look what kind what kind of data um, is published uh, to the Cumulosity. Uh, in, within Cumulosity, I have prepared, prepared um, a cockpit dashboard with uh, two different widgets. One widget is the is the is a line chart, and here you see both analog values um, for so the lines, the lines, and the, the oh, I did not sorry, I did not switch to the right scene. So, sorry for this mistake. So, um, here is once again, here is the cockpit in the cloud IoT, and uh, the lines, the color of the lines in the chart correspond to the color of the bars. Here you can see that the uh, data is updated in real time. Both signals have the same shape, but the blue measurements are are. Uh, are published, or is the blue measurement is changing more frequently, it is, which is uh, 10 times a second, whereas um, the violet measurement is changing only one time, as, uh, twice a second. Apart from the um, analog values which are displayed, uh, there is also a widget which is, um, is uh, which will show us uh, critical alarms. And um, if I hit the button, if I toggle the button on the HMI panel, you see an alarm popping up here. This, the naming and labeling of this alarm can be freely defi defined in the IPConf and uh, all the timestamp when this uh, alarm was um, was retrieved at IPConf site. So basically, right now we already have a solution with IPConf. Which allows you to integrate um, field devices in such a way that uh, the data can be uh, published uh, towards the um, Cumulosity IoT as measurements or as uh, critical alarm uh, or as alarms. Uh, let's um, in the next step. I would like to introduce our uh, web-based configuration tool, which is called VecConfig. This tool is used um, to configure the gateway and also to uh, update um, the software. So the only thing you need to configure the gateway is WebConfig. There are no other tools involved. <coughs> um, most interesting 
thing is the configuration itself. So due to the shortness, uh, the short time frame of this presentation, I will skip um, all the other aspects of the configuration and will focus on the um, con communication aspects. Um, how it is um, the uh, the protocol stacks and and the logging as well as the data point configuration. For our set uh, to connect a device to to IPConf, we need the protocol stacks. And uh, for our setup, we have the first protocol stack is an IC104 master, which collects the data from the Wagon RTU. Then we have a S7 client, which uh, retrieves the data, periodically requests the data from the Siemens PLC. And then we have uh, two MQTT publisher, which um, which will retrieve the data within IPConf from both this source protocol stacks and will publish them to the Cumulosity. Why are there they? Why do we use two different uh, MQTT publisher? The reason is that data is not the same as the, that. You have different types and categories of data. If you take a, a look at um, a close look to this. Um, line chart, you will see that um, the, the violet chart is updated every second and the blue chart is updated every five seconds. The reason for this is that, um, as I already mentioned, the blue measurement <coughs> generates 10 samples a second. And if, uh, if we would publish every time an MQTT telegram, when a new sample arrives, this would uh, cause a high load on the network. And to avoid this and to improve the, uh, the throughput, we, we con I have configured the second MQTT publish, publish in such a way that it aggregates all data point changes within five seconds and, and will group them to send it out in a single MQTT telegram. On the other hand, you have data like alarms. You have data like, like alarms uh, where you don't want to have any delay. It's a, it's a very time critical data and you want to see this, this data as soon as possible within uh, your um, within your cloud application. That's why- uh, for, for Boris, just one quick point. So I, I know you've got lo lots of information here. Um, uh, we, we're coming to the end of this session. So one of it's possible to wrap up in the next 30 seconds or so. You, all right. All right. Um, uh, so basically, this is uh, you use a different. You can use a different. You can use a, a different protocol stacks to connect different devices of different vendors, and you have powerful tools like the simulation area to to change um, to change to see the real time values of the of the data points and to change them, and you have an online logging. Which provides you with, with the ability to see the telegrams on the line in parallel, uh, in real time. And um, I think with the capabilities of IPConf to have a flexible communication platform and to support uh, a lot of different protocols, it is well suited to, to take the part of an edge device which will connect uh, any kind of uh, field devices from the OT to the um, the cloud environment. And um, with this said, if you're looking for a flexible, scalable, robust, and reliable communication solution, IPConf is definitely your choice. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot for uh, for your attention. And um, your questions are, of course, welcome. Sorry for the, uh, sorry that I had to wrap up, wrap up my um, presentation. But if you have any interest or you need some kind of information, please get in contact with us or take a look at our website. Thanks a lot for the attention. Excellent, Th thank you. Um, thank you, Edgar. So, um, it, so if you can have a drop, drop the screen share for the moment. So, um, so that there's lots of information now. I think um, Edgar is probably useful to, um, to do a, a, a longer video. So I think that's uh, probably quite a useful thing to do because I, I know there's um, a lot of interest out there from, from the audience. Um, Whereas the previous presenters have demonstrated how practical applications can be built on Finnish.io, um, what, what I'd like to show now, kind of hand over to um, uh, Boris, uh, Chris Managers from uh, Kunbus, who's actually going to show us 
uh, a live <laughs> deployment of uh, thinedge.io in a production line. So with, with the time we have available, uh, Boris, uh, over to you. Can you see me? Uh, can you see me and hear me? Yes, yes, we can now, yes. Ah, that's great. So welcome to our production line at Kunbus, where we produce the Revolution Pi. And uh, maybe some of you know the industrial grade Raspberry Pi, and here are robots bringing the devices to the soldiering um, area. And what we've prepared is a little showcase. I will try to get behind the robot. This robot is, um, yeah, Heidi. The, the workers gave them names. So um, what do we have here for you? Today, we show you a setup where we attached a sensor, this time from Cognex. The guys from Cognex were so kind to provide it to us. We attached this sensor to a Revolution Pi, which you may know, and we will be sending data to the cloud. We have seen that several times today, so I think this is something everybody understood. But what is quite interesting is what happens when people get a Revolution Pi off the shelf. So for those who don't know the Revolution Pi, we come from the field bus section, creating field bus network cards. So we have field bus extension modules for every industrial um, or almost any industrial um, network or bus system. We have also IO modules to connect literally any sensor type to the Revolution Pi. And yeah, what we do now is um, we want to buy something off the shelf and start with thin edge IO. So what we prepared is an image which comes shipped with your Revolution Pi. In this case, you can just unwrap it and the thin edge client is already on the device. The next thing we can do, let me just go behind the scenes and show it to you. First of all, this sensor, I should mention that this sensor will pick up um, a barcode from every robot that's approaching here. So we can see what robot is coming here and send this data over because we know what this robot is, um, is producing. We could also have attached something, um, some sensors on the parts, but they are too hot. Um, we didn't do that for now. So let me go to screen share. like this. And as we have heard, there's a number of ways to program. One way that everybody knows and is quite simple would be to use um, Node-RED in this case. We have seen how to do that, right? So um, this is not the most interesting part. The interesting part is when we get to the Revolution Pi and we log on to that, we already have the Thin Edge client on it when it comes shipped to us. And the next thing is we notice this RevPi 59757, and this is the ID of the RevPi. So what we can do is we can just upload our certificate, which is already on the device, and we can, if we didn't set that in the, um, in the upload of the image, so at our factory before we ship the device, then we can set our, um, yeah, our um, tenant. So setting the tenant, then we upload the certificate And we did upload that. Let's go online and check. Let's have a look if we can see something. There it is. This is the time you need to upload a certificate and to register a device. The second thing we can do, you have seen that several times today, is uh, to connect the device and then we will be getting sensor data. In the meantime, you can see the robots running by. 
Let's try. Yep, successfully. We have seen that too. I will try to do it very fast so that we save some time. Um, let's take, we have seen it, an MQTT node and add a broker, which is localhost. Don't make a typo now. Uh, and we add that. Now we need a topic for our local host. We go to the documentation, search for topic. That's very straightforward. We have uh, tested the uh, 0.4 version and it works like a charm. We go back at that topic. Next thing we need is a function node. We want to have some payload here. Let's go back and take the standard example and rush back to the function node. And as you know, node red, this is nothing new for you. We take this one, we take the message payload. No typos right now. And what I want to send is some IDs of the robots. This is pretty much it. The next thing we want to do, we want to make sure this is um, JSON data. So we want to transform that into JSON. We want to have a cycle. So we take an inject node and say that it should inject once after the start and then in an interval of uh, one seconds. Next thing we want to do, we went into the before the presentation, we went into uh, our configuration tool Pictory, added a virtual device, which is the uh, barcode scanner that you can see. And this device is just registered and will put its output into input one. So we go back to node red and what we do, we have revolution pi nodes and we will use this get pin and add the local host server and select the input one and hopefully when i didn't forget something yeah we should just add something else because we don't want to have the same value a lot of times so this cool note helps us just to send something if the payload has changed so we put that in between here like this and this is our flow. Let's see if it works. We take a little debug note, go here. And now the last idea, this barcode sensor red was 210. Let me go back to the barcode and I prepared something or let us do the real thing in case that no robot gets along here. Uh, okay. I have prepared a little robot that is a bit heavy. Okay, my colleague will bring it and we can just test some barcodes and hopefully, do we see something? You can post it in the chat. When the robot comes along here, we would have another barcode which is scanned from the robot. So you can see, yes, one was my piece of paper, one was my sheet of paper, and one was the robot that came across here. So what does it say to us? Um, it's not only something we can experiment with. If we handle the device management part, and if we bring that up and running, we will have a ready to use product in simply no time. And this helps people just to have loads of devices um, sent into the field. Let me then take the last minute to show you a little bit in here. So this was the setup we used. And this is what I told you. We have a lot of different um, uh, networks and uh, field buses that we support. We have a lot of devices. If you don't know Revolution Pi, we have 59,000 devices in the field, more than that. 
And you can program, and I mean you can program the thin edge, um, yeah, send data to thin edge from Revolution Pi with Python. We already did that. We have an example with Node-RED, with Logicut, with Microsoft.NET, C, and Codesys. And the next thing that I wanted to tell you is that we will be on the SPS fair. And if you want to talk, and if you want to exchange some yeah, thoughts, exchange some ideas, exchange some knowledge, or exchange some projects and get us involved, then we can just, I try to stop screen sharing, then we can just meet on the SPS in November and have a little chat. So that's my little presentation from the shop floor. I hope you liked it. And now back to you. <laughs> Excellent. Thank, thank you, Boris. It's an amazing, uh, amazing presentation. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much for that. So um, so what, what I'm aware is that we've, um, uh, we've we've had so much interest, so much energy from our speakers and so different questions coming through. So we've actually run out of time for the Q&A. So uh, please fill in the survey uh, and also uh, please feel free to either send us uh, your uh, comments and queries and sort of questions uh, either via the meetup or kind of um, via the, um, uh, the 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 email addresses that have actually been raised so far. So, with that, uh, unfortunately, um, we we've run out of time for for this first session. So uh, we've tr tried to pack a lot in, but it's uh, it's I think it's it's gone well. But there's um, maybe our expectation was kind of greater of what we can do in a short space of time. So I would like to thank uh, all the presenters and demonstrators. So I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed it and I think our, our audience did as well. So uh, also to make you aware, uh, so IFM, Software AG and the other contributors, we're actually uh, recruiting in this space at the moment. So please feel free to spread the word through your contact networks to those who may want to come on board in a professional capacity around kind of thin edge and its deployment in this um, uh, lightweight embedded scenario. Uh, and with that, I'm going, I'd like to say uh, thank you for joining us. So stay safe. Uh, and we will see you in uh, mid-January for our next meetup. So um, thank you for attending, and we look forward to speaking to you the next time. Thank you very much.